Welcome to Cinematic Void Podcast. Cinematic Void is a cult film series that hosts screenings in the Los Angeles area and virtually. You can find Cinematic Void on the World Wide Web at cinematicvoid.com, as well as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Patreon. By joining our Patreon, you help make this podcast possible, as well as Cinematic Void Up All Night and the Cinematic Movie, which is our monthly screening series. I'm your host, Jim Branscombe, and joining me through the power of the internet is... Hey, what's up? It's Nick Vance. You can find me at Paranoid Futures on all the social media stuff. What are we getting into today? Well, we're getting into Lucio Fulci. In fact, we're going to be talking a lot of Fulci on the next several episodes of the Cinematic Void podcast. So to kick things off, I figured we would talk about the film Fulci for Fake. And because it ties in with it, we are also going to talk about Cat in the Brain, a.k.a. Um, Nightmare Concert, which is kind of Fulci's version of Eight and a Half. I think they both share, share a lot of parallels, especially with, you know, Fulci for Fake is a documentary on Fulci. Cat in the Brain is basically a meta telling of Fulci in a Fulci movie. So I guess we'll start off with Fulci for Fake, which is directed by Simone Scafati. Actor Nicola Nacella is researching director Lucia Fulci for a role. So he sets out and interviews the people that know Fulci best, including Fulci's two daughters, Antoinella and Camilla. His longtime cinematographer, Sergio Silvada, composer Fabio Frizzi, assistant director Michele Sove, and actor Paolo Malco from New York Ripper and House by the Cemetery. And obviously, because of the title, it's also a riff on that Orson Welles movie, App for Fake, which is it was a pseudo documentary about magic where supposedly everything's true, but at a certain point in the movie, Orson's like, after like, I forget what the time frame is, but he switches that after a certain point, everything in the movie is no longer true and it's all a lie. So it's kind of like a fun play on it. And I watched a screener copy of it, and you did as well. And what what were your initial thoughts on watching it, Nick? Uh, I really liked it. Um, yeah, the uh, I, I haven't seen that uh, Orson Welles film, uh, Orson Welles documentary, so I, I can't compare the two um, as far as that plot device where it's the actor. I, I don't know how much that has to do with it. But uh, I, I thought that was cool, and my, my only real critique is I, I wish they, they would have used that a little more. Um, but otherwise, it's awesome, awesome and uh, really cool to hear. Um, so I, just really cool to hear more background on Fulcher in general, because I don't, I don't know too much about his personal life or his relationships. So it was really cool. Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, Antoinella is the one daughter I was – most aware of that had been, you know, very vocal and championing her father's career over the years. Camilla was honestly like, I didn't realize he had a second daughter or maybe if if he did, I just, you know, never really thought about it. So it was, it was kind of cool. She was a focus because she had really good stories and it kind of like, you got to kind of get inside Fulci because, you know, we, before we did this portion of it, we just did a long, episode about Fulci zombie movies and we kind of with our friend Matthew Gray of um, The Lice and Shivering Window and we kind of got in how complicated Fulci is and this movie does a real good job of breaking just how complicated of a person he was and like, like getting vices and his like angst and like just getting everything out in his films and I also think this film is a really 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 it's a really strong way of just putting out there just how much of a really fantastic filmmaker Fulci is and probably still doesn't get the credit he deserves. Obviously he made gory movies, but like, he's just, he had an incredible career and like, it kind of got rough towards the end. And then maybe his great comeback didn't happen as they talk about in the documentary, but it's, it's kind of good because you get to see different sides. You get to see it from people that work with them on set and, Fabio Frizzi, obviously, being his longtime composer, and Michele Sove, who was his assistant director on Gates of Hell and then went on to be a director of his own right doing Stage Fright and Cemetery Man. And it's just, you got to see different sides of Fulci. Which brings yeah. us to Cat in the Brain, which is, you know, Fulci's, you know, variation of Eight and a Half. It's, it is kind of the Fleeny-esque horror movie. So, I... I kind of revisited Cat and Brain a little bit before doing this, and it's it's kind of goofy, but it's like it's also very, very si- sincere in what it's doing. So, for those of you who haven't seen it, basically, Fulci is playing a fictionalized version of himself who thinks the movies he's making is causing him to kill people. 
So he goes to the psychiatrist and asks for advice, but in turn, the psychiatrist is actually a serial killer who is basically taking Fulci's, like, movie murders and recreating in real life and then making Fulci think he's actually killing people. It's twisted, it's fun, and for a Latter-day Fulci, it's... Like, it's one of his best films, and I'd say it's one of the best films of his career. Now, it, it uses a bunch of different clips from other movies, some of which Fulci was a producer on, not necessarily a director, but those films are Bloody Psycho, Sodoma's Ghost, Hansel and Gretel, Massacre, The Murder Secret, and Touch of Death. Made me, uh, made me wonder if the, the concept of the movie was built around just using those other clips, or what was the, what was the real purpose behind that, whether it was just uh, <clears throat> you know, to save money? Um, what was the reason that they went with just a bunch of already previously used clips? I, I I think money was part of it because they also recycle like music and other things throughout of his career. I think it's in a way it kind of feels like a mixtape of Fulci. Like you know, obviously he's not pulling from his greatest hits because rights issues, but this was stuff he could had access to that he could use, and it's just kind of a. A fun movie and it's probably the opportunity i'm assuming it had to do with budget and opportunity it's like okay you can do this but you have to do it this way and you have this much money so it's just basically problem solving to make it happen <laughs> but but cutting back and forth it's like it's he makes good use of everything and you know say what you will Fulci gives a really solid performance as a fictionalized version of himself but i think cat in the brain ties in really well with Fulci for fake especially because it's just it's kind of like two sides of the same coin almost, except one is Fulci dissecting himself. And then the other side of it is, you know, another director going through all the people that knew him best to kind of break things down. If you want to do this double feature, I highly recommend it. You can get Cat in the Brain from Grindhouse releasing. And as I said on the American Cinematheque virtual screening room, Fulci or Fake will start playing Thursday, July 23rd through Sunday the 26th. When you make a purchase, you have 72 hours to watch the film. So go ahead and check that out. And as an added bonus, um, I'm hosting a Q&A with David Gregory of Severn Films, who is the um, distributor of Fulci for Fake in the United States, on Friday, July 24th at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. You can go to AmericanCinematech.com for details and um, sign up the code and watch the virtual Q&A through Zoom. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about the film. We're going to talk about some of the Fulci releases Severn has done in the past and a couple they're getting ready to release pretty soon as well as Fulci for Fake. They're reissuing two of Fulci's like later kind of really cool movies, Enigma and um, Demonia, which if you haven't seen, they're worth checking out. We're going to be talking about those two on a very special episode of the Cinematic Void podcast where we get into um, Fulci's supernatural films. That one's only going to be on Patreon. So, hey, not on Patreon, not going to hear that. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, we're going to be joined by Matthew Gray of The Lice and Shivering Window as we discuss Lucio Fulci's zombie film quartet on the Cinematic Void podcast. It is midnight on a tropical island. A beautiful young girl's long hair streams against the coral reef. Her beautiful body is caressed by the tide. Suddenly, a decayed hand rises up and blood-drenched jaws move to bite her. The living dead walk again. Zombie. They are decaying. They are missing from their graves. They live and hunger for your flesh. There is no place you can hide. Zombie, you are what they eat. No one under 17 will be admitted. Zombie. Joining us today on the Cinematic Void podcast is a friend of Nick and I's. He is currently in the band The Lice, and he was formerly in a band called Shivering Window that I did a couple music videos for. Please welcome Matthew Gray. Hi, nice to be here on Cinematic Void. We're, we're talking about Fulci's zombie movies. We're going to primarily talk about the first four, but we'll also briefly talk about Zombie 3. And I guess we'll just, right out of the gate, start with the first one. Actually, before we start on the first one, the thing I, lo I was looking at all the movies, because I actually re-watched them all back to back to back, which I probably, I've never watched them in chronological order that they oh. came out at any point in my life. And these are the, like, the takeaways I got watching all four is that he maintained a pretty tight team that worked on essentially all the films or most of the films. So obviously Lucio Fulci was the director of all four films and he was the co-writer on the Beyond, Gates of Hell, House by the Cemetery. 
Dardano Scadetti was a writer on all film, all four of the films, except he was uncredited on Zombie. His wife was the only one who got a credit because I think his father passed away and he didn't want to be credited on a movie about death at the time, which is weird because then he went and wrote three more of these fucking things. <laughs> uh, Sergio Salvada was the cinematographer on all four of them. Vincenzo Tomasi was the editor on all four of them. Jeanette De Rossi did effects on everything except for Gates of Hell. Fabrizio De Angelis was the producer on everything except for Gates of Hell. Fabio Frizzi composed all the soundtracks except for House by the Cemetery. Katrina McCall, she was in everything except for Zombie. Al Cleaver, who's an actor, appeared in Zombie and the Beyond. Laza Brigandi, who is Dardano's wife, she co-wrote Zombie and House by the Cemetery with him. And Walter Rizzati was the composer on House by the Cemetery. So looking at all the four of these films and... There's other ones that came around the same time, like Black Cat and things like that. Like, Fulci had maintained a pretty solid team all the way through, which is very interesting because, you know, not a lot of people are able to do that, especially in the Italian spectrum, because they usually switch cinematographers, different editors, have different composers. So I also think that's what kind of makes them unique as a whole when you watch them all. You guys have any thoughts on that? No, I was just looking about, yeah, they were all done within, like, Two years, huh? That's, that's yeah. crazy. I didn't realize the time frame was that tight. I thought, for some reason, like, I thought it was like a like a little wider time frame, but that's crazy. And he made other films, too, so yeah. That's probably why some of the movies are so feverish. They were working so quick. If you know anything about Italian production, like, they were shooting non-sync, but, like, Fulci, I think, I think most of the actors were doing phonetic English as they're talking. Like, the people who spoke English spoke English. But the Italians were doing phonetics, so it would be easier for them to dub later. Maybe not on all of them, but, like, clearly if you watch, like, Zombie, you know someone's actually Italian, and they're being dubbed, and it's really, really good. So it, they did little things that made a difference between, say, like, Burial Ground or Dr. Butcher, which were a little more, like, slapdash and rushed. Yeah, rough around the edges, yeah. So let's start with the first one, which was Zombie, a.k.a. Zombie 2, a.k.a. Zombie Flesh Eaters. It stars Ian McCullough, Tisa Farrow, sister of Mia, Richard Johnson, best known for being The Haunting, Al Cliver, Oretta Gay, and Olga Kolatos. So let's just get to why this movie happened in the first place. It was made as a cash-in knockoff of George Romero's Dawn of the Dead because Dawn of the Dead came out in Italy as Zombie. And I don't know. I watched it pretty recently, and I've always I've liked Zombie, but it was it used to be my least favorite. But Upon rewatching it, it's I have a whole new appreciation for it. Cause I, I haven't seen it since high school, and I I watched it last week, and yeah, same. I love it so much more than I did back then. Yeah, I probably saw. I I wish I rewatched all these th- movies, but uh, I didn't actually actually get to. Actually, the last time I saw the other three besides Zombie was at Cinematic Void. <laughs> thing, so so that's cool. <laughs> I saw all three, or maybe Beyond might uh, might have been Beyond Fest with Fabio Fritzi. But um, they were all at the Egyptian. But yeah, Zombie I haven't seen in probably ooh, three or four years. But uh, Zombie was actually the third Italian horror movie I'd say I saw after um, maybe fourth. Because I think I saw I, I saw Suspiria and then the only other Argento I could find because I was in a small town. The only other Argentos I could find at the video stores in my small town were uh, Creepers and Trauma. So, and then Zombie was the, the next Italian horror movie I was able to track down. So, uh, it was really like one of my gateway drugs into that whole world. And really, I mean, okay, pun intended, really eye opening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, the, to that whole world. So, definitely, definitely an important, influential film, I feel. Yeah. Also it, my favorite of the four. But hey, you know, the other three wouldn't exist without it. Yeah. It it's it's interesting because it's definitely a slow burner, but it's intentionally like that. I know basically they shot in New York for the first part of it, and they probably had to shoot as fast as possible because permits in New York are expensive. They probably were then, they still are now. But they use the location really, really good until they get to the island. Obviously, Dawn of the Dead was the reason why this movie got made, but it took a completely different route. It's more in line with the, I guess, the voodoo zombie movies, stuff like I Walked with a Zombie and things like that. The zombies look different than Romero zombies because they have that really, like, I, you know, some people might not like it, but I think it's really iconic, that pottery look. Like the really aged, moldy, 
-hmm. like yeah. really decrepit thing. I mean, I prefer the Fulci zombie look, at least in that movie, because it changes from movie to movie. But, you know, I prefer that to Ramiro's zombie look, you know, the whole just paint people blue, which, you know, is, of course, <laughs> legendary in its own right. And I'm not knocking Ramiro, but like, it's clearly scarier. It's clearly scarier. It's History more... wasn't kind to the blue zombie. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, and as you move up in HD and you look at that zombie makeup, it, like, you know, it's iconic, but, like, when you watch something that's, like, I think I showed Dawn of the Dead in 3D, and, like, you can see the grease paint marks on, like, the blue zombies. Right. And it's not not because anyone was doing anything bad. It's just, like, that. that's where it was technology-wise. And, like, you know, if you had to, like, paint, like, a hundred people blue sure. it's not gonna look at scale with the money romero had i'm sure that yeah. was like their best solution obviously yeah. fulci did not probably have the money romero had well but... look well looking at it so allegedly dawn had a million dollar budget but i when rubenstein was actually at beyond fest i think he admitted it was closer to like maybe six hundred thousand half a million uh -huh. which is the same budget they shot zombie on oh wow well i'm wrong I mean, Fulci's movies look good. They they look for the era. I mean, they look good. They're not... I mean, if there's anything cheap about them, it's more of an aesthetic decisions. It's not the it's not the actual, like, look of the films. And they're always shot on locations, you know? So. I mean, they do look really, really well. And that was the most... I mean, I, I guess, like, this is... Not every film that gets a restoration gets up to 4K ends up looking good. The, I watched the Blue Underground 4K disc of Zombie, and like it, it that's another reason what changed my perspective on it because I was always kind of worried about like when you move up HD, it's like how does things, how does the scrutiny of more definition affect something that you weren't really supposed to get a great look at? Those zombie makeups hold up pretty well under like HD scrutiny. I, I'm sure they took some care in the color correction and all that. Um, some other things I was looking at, or I was thinking about, it's, um, this is the only one I've never seen in a theater. I saw it in a theater, but a really, really long time ago at the, uh, silent movie theater. I think even, no, I think it was Cine Family at that time, and they did, like, there was other zombie movies, because I also saw, what's the one where they're in the water? Shock? Wave. Shock Waves? Yeah, and a couple others, I forget which. It was, like, a triple feature, or, I think it was a triple feature, I don't remember what the other one was. But yeah, and this was one I just I've always missed. Like it's played, I've had opportunities it's like eh, I'll go see it next time, and that's mostly because like it wasn't like I disliked it. It's just like eh, it's, it wasn't as big up there. But now that I rewatched, it's like God damn it, I need to see it on the screen. Looking at zombie and everything goes into it, it's like I I feel like the best way to break them down is like the iconic moments because I think what what these movies lack in plot. They make up on, like, getting to point A to point B, which is the set pieces. So let's talk about the opening, which is, like, basically Richard's, Richard Johnson kind of in silhouette waiting as the zombies rise up and he shoots him. He's like, the boat can leave now. Like, that is, like, that's a great intro into the movie because you get that and then the Fabio Frizzi um, zombie theme drops and it's just like, what the fuck is about to happen here? <laughs> yeah, it's a great theme. I mean, it is also kind of a rip off of dawn of the dead but you know it's again i don't know it's like something like kind of more intense about it same thing with the zombie makeup like they just maybe they just felt they needed to take things a little bit further you know i and, yeah because like this came out in 79 dawn was finished in 78 but i know it had like distribution issues for a while because they want to release it unrated and that kind of thing and i think i think they said like if we're gonna put out a rip off of Dawn of the Dead, which was zombie in Italy and zombies Dawn of the Dead in England, we gotta fucking top it. And I, although the opening is a little like you don't see anything graphic, you get to that first like scene when they're on the boat and they like find the the big like heavy set like zombie captain that's like walking around that looks like a pro wrestler that rips out that cop's throat. <laughs> it's like it's it's really shocking and it's like it's actually a little more visceral than when you see the first zombie bite in like Dawn of the Dead. Almost with Dawn, like the first zombie bites when they're um in the police raid and they're like busting in the doors. There's so much going on. Yeah, it doesn't have as much impact. I mean, I still think probably the most iconic is the Night of the Living Dead attack in the cemetery at the beginning. That's that kind of set the bar. But you know, even still, I mean, for for a zombie attack, you know, Fulci definitely like hits it. 
Yeah, I mean, because when you look at it, like, all those zombie attacks are, like, really, it's not even, like, in mass. It's, like, one zombie, and then, like, the others come in. It's never, like, the Romero thing where it's always, like, a pack. Right. It mauls you. It's just less zombies overall. (laughs) Which might be by budget or might be by design. So, we had the zombie on the boat. The next big thing that comes up in zombie, which is probably one of the most iconic things in any film ever made, which is... Fucking zombie versus a shark. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's. I think that's a lot of people who maybe aren't Fulci fans. Let's say uh, that's that's what they remember about this movie. <laughs> that's that's the first thing, you know, zombie versus shark. It's uh, it's audacious. It's it's insane, and you know how they came about is like there was a shark trainer, which I don't even think you can train sharks, because um I remember reading the jaws <laughs> the jaws log the the movie that um the book that was written about whether we're making jaws they they talked about like trying to hire shark trainers like well sharks don't really have a brain per se so you can't really train them so my understanding is this guy that owned a tiger shark he fed it and then he like doped it up yeah they definitely gave it some tranquilizers yeah but (laughs) you couldn't do that today no. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Animal cruelty in their films. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's not really. It, I, mean, I mean, it's probably, it's probably less cruel than a Diodato film. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> maybe the shark enjoyed it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they fed him. They got him a little stoned. I mean, it's a good day for the shark. I mean, the shark probably had no. <laughs> well, the shark probably didn't know what was going on. It's like, whoa. And they just basically kind of wrestle with it. But, like, the fact that you see a human wrestling with a live shark, regardless if it's doped up or not, is just like. It's insane. It's a, it's a tiger shark, too. It's not. Yeah. Full zombie makeup underwater. <laughs> it was the trainer, too. The trainer was the zombie, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, the trainer was a zombie. Like, like for sure, but I, just clarifying. Like, the setup to get to it is also, like, this really titillating sexploitation-like objectification oh, right. of, of Rada Gay, who's like, oh, I'm going to go skin diving. And it just, like, it's the longest, like, putting on, like, an air tank to go underwater without a top on. And like it just cuts to Ian McCullough looking at her and then like Al Cliver's just like eating something and then Tisa Ferrer looks at Ian McCullough and he like looks to stop and then he goes back to looking. It's just this weird like perverted setup. She yeah. goes underwater, gets attacked by a zombie or she goes underwater, a shark comes for her, and then she gets attacked by a zombie and then the zombie and shark fight. And I don't you know it's like where the fuck does that idea even come from? <laughs> I mean, obviously, I think Jaws was still in the air, right. at least like in the late. I think the probably Jaws two had probably gotten ready, had already come out by then. So like, shark movies were coming out. We're hot, yeah. It almost so seems like that was like in the producer's contract to like Fulci or whatever. That was like, we need a topless scene and we need a shark, and you'll get another like two hundred thousand. I don't know what they use lira. No, that's Spanish. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> but- but yeah, it's just, it's just incredible, and it's just like every time I watch it, it's like I can't believe this actually is on film. Obviously, you can't do it now, or if they do it, it's like CGI. But it's just like it's amazing. It's just like obviously, Fulci wasn't underwater directing it, but like I'm sure whoever's doing the underwater camera work or second unit was just like, this is what we need. It's memorable because like you might not remember anything else from Zombie except for what we're going to talk about next, but like that makes the movie. And what we're going to talk about next is poor Olga <laughs> Carlotta's giant splinter in her eye. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the second most memorable moment of the film. <laughs> I actually think they're, I think they're like neck and neck, really. Because, like, I think you see the shark thing, it's like, how do you top that? And then Fulci's like, let me show you, literally. I can't think of a worse eye trauma in any film. Is there, it's is pre- there a filmmaker more obsessed with the uh, injuries to eyes than Fulci? I, I, I don't sure. I don't think so. And like and we'll get into it a little bit later when we talk about some of the other ones, but like he does love his eye violence. And like th- this whole setup, it's like and he plays it out, he builds up this tension. It's like maybe she'll get out of it, maybe the zombie will let go. But like once that thing pops the pupil, it's just like holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so I mean, I haven't seen it in a while, so I might be misremembering. 
but it takes so long <laughs> for the splinter to actually get there. It's just oh, like, it feels like 10 minutes, but it's probably only like six thirty seconds or something, but it feels long. It It's actually perfectly, it's like, this is how you actually do a slow burn and then pay it off in full because it's just like, you see her getting closer. It cuts to the, like the wood spl- as the camera moves into the wood splinter. It cuts back to her. It cuts to the zombie hand. It, like it cuts around. It's beautifully set up, and then it just delivers. And like, <laughs> especially when it goes deeper and deeper and deeper, and goes to the point when like it breaks off, and then it cuts to the other angle, and you just see the splinter like thing shoved in her eye. And she's just like screaming. Like that's how you top a zombie versus shark by shoving a giant piece of wood in someone's eye. It's true. I kind of almost don't remember the last, like, was like, 10, 15 minutes of the movie after that. Just, like, it's really dark. That's what I remember. They're on, they're on the island at that point, and it's really dark, and people are running around, and zombies are popping up with maggots on their faces. Yeah. Uh, after that, they, they kind of end up at um, Richard Johnson's Dr. Menard's, like, right. I guess, lab, like, hospital thing, and then, like, they drive over to go visit his wife, and that's when they find her, and the zombies are eating her. And then... Basically, it gets like dark outside, and they get actually before it. Actually, before it gets dark, that brings up to another iconic moment because it's the essentially it's the zombie on the box of the VHS. Oh right, right. It's the conquistador zombie rising from the grave, and like that's it's what, a. That's I remember. Yeah, yeah. We're clearly real, real maggots in use. Yeah, he loves maggots. It's, it's it's terrifying. <laughs> it's 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 just awful. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, yeah, that's a good makeup effect there for whatever they were working with. I mean, it, maybe they couldn't breathe. I don't know. But it's Because <laughs> when you think of Romero's stuff, you don't really see him rise out of the grave. You see him, like, already dead and, like, kind of, like, sit up after they've been bitten and have died and then reanimate. So it's, like, it does kind of harken back to, like, a more older tradition of horror where, like, you're basically seeing, like, this zombie come out of the grave bites that um, red gay's throat, and then, like, all these others start popping up. And, like, in scale of amount of zombies, obviously there's not as many zombies and zombie as Dawn of the Dead, but, like, the ones he have are really effective because they're all pretty unique-looking. Part of Some of them are pottery, some of them are just, like, grayed-out makeup with some, like, scars and blood and shit. Yeah, I feel like also zombie just, yeah, has that really downbeat vibe to it, downbeat ending, maybe even more so than Romero's films, which... Well, actually, Dawn of the Dead is a slightly upbeat ending, even though everyone's dead, but, you know. I mean, Night is, like, pessimism and, like, a reflection of, like, the time. And it's still relevant. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a scary part that, like, Dawn, Night of the Living Dead came out in 1969 is still relevant. But because we're going through this whole coronavirus and pandemic thing, like, the ending of the zombie is pretty, like... Bleak. Yeah, it's bleak, and it's it kind of feels real, which is what we were going to kind of talk about next, which is like, once they get off the island, they're on the boat. It's like, maybe we can go back to New York. We got, cause Al Cleaver's character gets bit and he becomes a zombie and they have him trapped in the boat. It's like, we got to prove this happened. And they turn on the radio and they can just hear New York's already invaded. People are already infected. And then it cuts to that shot of the Brooklyn bridge where the zombies are like trudging across. And this is another great iconic shot. Again, that you probably wouldn't be able to get today for like under like, a Hollywood budget, you know? No. And it's really terrific. Like, clearly, they shot at rush hour and there's cars just flying by, but, like, it gives the perception that, like, people are, like, fleeing the city. And they make it work. And plus, it's, like, the ridiculous, like, radio sound or whatever. Like, they're in the building! Ah! Kind of thing. It really is bleak because it's just, like, they're heading back to to America and, like, they're heading back to what they just left. Yeah. Honestly, I, I feel like that bleakness is definitely one of the... Uh trademark characteristics of Fulci's work not just the zombie movies but almost almost all of his movies I've seen yeah it really downbeat outlook <laughs> <laughs> it's a feel bad movie it's it's really cool to see those zombies but like when you think of it especially in the context now it's like Jesus Christ hey, we're all fucked <laughs> it's, it's yeah. where we're at <laughs> yeah I mean it's definitely when people want to make a case for Fulci being an auteur, which maybe I don't know if you want to get into that or not, but like I know a lot of people, he's kind of historically been viewed as a craftsman, I think, because he made so many films in so many different styles. But I feel like if you want to make a case for him being an auteur, that uh, that bleakness is definitely one of the things that carries through. And it's an identifiable trait in his body of work. Before we move off from Zombie, a couple things I want to mention. 
Another cool thing about all four of these movies is Fulci has a little cameo in all of them. And he's dubbed differently each time. So the one he has in Zombie, he's on Ian McCullough's, like, newspaper editor. Right. I, he's not in it for a lot, but, like, it's... I. It's it's not quite the look for Hitchcock in the Hitchcock movie cameo, but when Fulci pops up, it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then they double him with some ridiculous voice. It's like, that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one last thing before we move on from zombie. It's a little weird fact. So the the captain, the big the heavy set zombie at the beginning on the boat, apparently after they got done the shoot, he left in full costume, covered in blood, still in zombie makeup, and he went to CBGB's to go have a drink. <laughs> and he just kind of walked in, bouncers let him in, didn't say shit, got his drink in the bar, bartenders didn't pay him no mind, because everyone there was, like, dressed, you know, it was all punks and that kind of stuff, and, like, no one gave a shit, so, it was like, this yeah. dude dressed like a zombie was just completely unassuming at, like, this <laughs> famous <laughs> punk club in New York. New York in, like, the late, in New York in the 70s and through, like, the early 80s really seems, like, messed up, but also kind of, like, great. <laughs> I mean, every time I hear stories about 42nd Street and those grindhouses, it's like, wow, I wish it could go, but not really. No, because I don't want to get stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's basically where I'm at. Within Fulci's four zombie movies, the main ones we're talking about, he actually created a trilogy within, which is his Gates of Hell trilogy, which are kind of inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, I guess a little bit. Definitely, I, yeah. Definitely, I'd say. I mean, not the Elder Ones or whatever they're called, the Old Gods, whatever Lovecraft was on. Not Cthulhu and stuff, but definitely, like, the vibe. Is very but The weird, like, New England horror and, like, yeah. kind of cultism, witchcraft stuff going on. Uh, reference to fake mystical books, too, is obviously very Lovecraft, and later picked up by Evil Dead, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So, this next one is City of the Living Dead slash Gates of Hell. Um... I don't... What t What title do you guys prefer for it? Uh, I guess I've been using City of the Living Dead longer because of the DVD release that came out. Gates of Hell is actually... The, as Gates of Hell, it was the second Fulci movie I saw because I was able to find that on, in my small town on VHS. Um, but I think it might have been slightly caught. I don't remember. Was it the, caught? The VHS? No, no the VHX... VHS was actually not cut for this one. Okay, because, yeah, I remember all the gore, so I guess it wasn't, yeah. Gates oh. of Hell is kind of a more striking title, but I've been calling it City of the Living Dead forever, so I don't know. I'm more used to that. I'm kind of <laughs> stuck on Gates of Hell because that's what I remember it. And my local video store always had the box of Gates of Hell, but they never had a copy to rent. And it drove me insane because, like, I couldn't see it any other way. And I'm going to throw this out here because, like, this is how movie-obsessed I was in my teens. I had a dream that I went to a flea market, got a laser got a Laserdisc player, and got Gates of Hell on Laserdisc. And I was like, oh, fuck yeah, finally I can watch this movie. And I woke up so excited to, like, plug in this Laserdisc player and watch the Gates of Hell on Laserdisc. And then I realized, like, it was a dream. But we'll just call it Gates of Hell for uh, simplicity's sake, going yeah. forward. <laughs> going forward. So we're going to talk about Gates of Hell. It stars Christopher George, everyone's cigar chomping character actor from Love Rat that. Patrol. Love that, Love that guy. <laughs> Probably my favorite of the Fulci leading men from these movies. <laughs> these four so, movies. Yeah. I mean, essentially, Christopher George just plays Christopher George and a lot of this I mean, stuff. He was they, they... clearly drunk off his ass, right? Let's just be honest. <laughs> yeah. And this is one of the rare later Christopher George movies that he didn't do with his um, wife, Linda Day George. Which, because they did Day of the Animals together, they did Pieces together, they did um, Mortuary together, but she didn't end up in this, probably because they wanted Katrina McCall, who, this is her first Fulci movie, and her introduction to, and actually, she's the only one that's been in, was in all three, at least Fulci's Gates of Hell trilogy. Sure. There's Carla De Majo, I don't know if I'm pronouncing right, we'll just go with that. And everyone's favorite Italian whipping boy who dies horribly in every movie he's ever been in, John Morgan. Sure. And who's the woman who, uh, spoiler alert, vomits her guts? Because she gets killed <laughs> horribly in several different Fulci movies. That is Daniela Doria. Yeah, she... most, most uh, shamefully and horrifically probably in New York Ripper, which is just, you know, if you don't need a shower after that murder, you're probably <laughs> a bad person. Yeah, I... <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't understand the relationship. I've actually kind of looked he into. He was up it. for anything, apparently. <laughs> she, you know, 
know, vomiting real animal entrails. I don't, you know, just she also, I think, gets decapitated in House by the Cemetery, which is not, not quite that comparatively. No, she gets the <laughs> she gets the knife in the head, and I was going to talk about that when we get the house. Oh, right, like, through the mouth. No, that is bad. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a bad one too. Looking at Gates of Hell, like I said, this is the first of that trilogy he created. There. Loosely related. Let's not say fully related. They're loosely related. Watching Gates of Hell again, I feel like this one is the most uneven, and it's more of a hodgepodge of the four. It's like a lot of good set pieces, but like I know plot is not the most important thing in these movies, and they mm-hmm. operate on nightmare logic. But like this one's just like I don't. It's not even strung together. It's just like lightly taped. No, I mean I, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say it. I'm gonna throw it out there. It's my favorite of the four. Really? But honestly, for those reasons you say, it really is like a <laughs> It really is just like a dream. Like, it's so... And I feel like, for me, like, Fulci kind of like... And the Italian horror directors in general, but definitely Argento and then Fulci, it's like... It's kind of a gateway, like, bri- bridging that gap between horror and surrealism, almost. Like, I don't know, like, if Fulci was a surrealist influenced by surrealism. Definitely, like, Fellini, I know he was influenced by. But, like, I don't know if he was, like, into, like, you know, Cocteau or Bunuel or any of that stuff. But, like, it's his movies, whether purposefully or inadvertently, like, have a surreal vibe. And I think, for me, other than maybe Conquest, which is definitely dreamlike, I'd say Gates of Hell is... uh hits that the most where it just feels like a dream like a like a sickly dream i mean that's a it's a great quality for this movie because like he definitely took zombies into a weirder territory than like i think anyone else could he, even <laughs> yeah i mean that that's the those zombies fucking teleport um they jump out of nowhere like they're How right in front of you all these years later <laughs> what exactly they're doing to people's heads when they kill them like they like yeah. reach into their hair and then squish brains out. It's 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 a I don't know. <laughs> I mean that, that I mean that's yeah that that's the thing. It's like why are they crushing brains? And then the people come the back. Bar, why don't they leave? What is going on with those guys in the bar? I think it was Beyond Fest year year two when I first started working for Beyond Fest. Um, for some reason they had Schlitz as the beer sponsor. Right. No one's ever explained it, but then I remember the Gates of Hell when they're in that bar, like one of the big taps on it is the the Schlitz sign. So I remember cutting a fake Schlitz commercial with clips from a Schlitz commercial <laughs> and um Gates of Hell within. That end scene when the zombies are just like teleporting in the bar, they disappear, everyone's freaking out and I don't know. I'm just, I'm just promoting stupid things that I do. <laughs> well, that isn't that what this podcast is about? <laughs> Valid point, so I'll allow it because I'm the one doing it. <laughs> so this one I actually programmed a couple years ago when I did um, New England Nightmares, which was a series of movies that took place in New England. Although I think I think the Gates of Hell takes place in Dunwich, which is another Lovecraft reference. But I think most of it was shot in, besides the studio stuff in Italy, it was shot in upstate New York and a little bit in New York City. And I think the cemetery where the priest hangs himself was in um, Savannah, Georgia, of all places. I can see that. I've been to Savannah, yeah. That 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 makes sense. Weird. Yeah. I, and, for that. I, it's funny that they would just go to Savannah just for that. Yeah. And uh, I guess, you know, the most iconic scene of this movie, the zombie versus shark of this movie is, was it Bob? The, the, I forget the director's name, but yeah, uh, the actor's name, but he was in so much stuff. Getting John out. Morgan. Yeah. yeah. John Morgan, a.k.a. whatever his Italian name is, uh, who got murdered horribly in so many different movies. But yeah, the his whole character in the movie is so dreamlike. He's just running around in all this fog. That's the other thing in this movie. There's, is there a movie other than maybe John Carpenter's The Fog that has more fog than Gates of Hell? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... This wasn't quite soft focus smoke, Fulci. <laughs> that would be conquest, where like every fucking scene has like, like too much smoke. But like, there's a lot of fucking fog in <laughs> Gates of Hell. I mean, they could call it the Gates of Fog. But you know what? There's more of than than fog in this movie. Maggots. Maggots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were like, I think that one was. There was always these little callbacks, I think, the rivalry between Fulci and Argento, and that was, I think, I always felt that was his callback to Suspiria's maggot scene. He's like, you want maggots? I'll give you maggots. It's rough, man. <laughs> it's rough. <laughs> that is, 
It's too much that's for actually me. Kind of, <laughs> that, that's actually a pretty valid point, because I think Fulci, out of all the other Italian directors, did feel like he had a professional like rivalry with yeah. Argento. They're the Whether I, of Italian the, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones of Italian horror. <laughs> Um, I, I think Argento never really acknowledged it. And then Fulci just talked to a, ga- a gang, or Fulci just talked a shitload of shit about Argento. He actually talked a shitload about a lot of people. I don't know if you ever read Spaghetti Nightmares, which is a I did, yeah. book. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's, um, it's basically a, it's a book with a bunch of interviews with different um, Italian filmmakers, actors, producers, and like Fulci's is great because he like name drops people he's like allegedly friends with. Apparently, Fulci told like a lot of lies too. I <laughs> it, it's kind of hard to confirm, but it's both like my friend David Cronenberg, and it's just like man, Fulci just name dropping, talking yeah. shit, name drop. I mean, I don't want to like cut Fulci down exactly. The the Argento thing always seemed like a bit of jealousy, like you know, obviously, like he was jealous that Argento was the artist and he was the uh, craftsman goremonger <laughs> sleazy goremonger yeah I mean, in America no one cared they both we both, in America everyone thought they were just sleazy crap <laughs> <laughs> in Italy I think it was different I think Argento because his movies were so successful got treated with a lot of respect whereas Fulci maybe not um, yeah I, I think it's sort of like Bob Mario Baba like, he wasn't really beloved in Italy, but he became beloved elsewhere, and then they kind of like, oh, yeah, we love Baba, too. Get it now? Now that, now that the English and the Americans like you, we get it. <laughs> but yeah, I think Fulci had bared some jealousy towards Argento over a lot of this stuff. Because, like, I mean, let's be honest, like, I haven't, you know, I haven't really sat down and watching Argento movies recently. But I, I think Fulci was, he might not have had, like, the visual, I'm trying to think of a good comparison. I'd say... Argento is closer to Scorsese in a way that Fulci is more just stylized camera moves, moving camera, that kind of stuff. And I'm trying to think of what who would be the equivalent to Fulci. And I think Zoomlin, so I immediately think Robert Altman, but like Fulci doesn't operate like Robert Altman at all. Uh, I don't know. Fulci's Fulci. Fulci. Yeah, we haven't talked about. Uh, Fulci's extreme eye close-ups, which I think is one of maybe his most identifying characteristics as a as a director, even more than any other Italian film director. It's that zoom into the eyes he uses. Yeah, because he he didn't really do it in Zombie, but this was the beginning of him. U- I mean, I think he's used it in other movies. Like Zombie doesn't really do a lot of like zooms right in the eyes, but this one like it was coming back. I know in the Giallos he did it a little bit. Yeah, and I know Argento is kind of famous for that too, but he always used it more like as a kind of, you know, not to say Argento is not gratuitous with his camera movements, but more as a narrative device, like the close-ups on the eyes of the killer in uh, Deep Red, you know? Yeah. Black eye makeup to give you, like, some idea of the killer is, like, you know, not that you could probably ever figure it out if you hadn't seen it before. But anyway. So so a couple other things. I can't remember. I know I was talking about New England Nightmares. I played this with um, House by the Cemetery as a double feature, which we'll talk about House when we I think I went to I'm, I'm definitely sure I went to that. Yeah, yeah it, that was one of my favorite doubles. Um, Fulci again has a cameo. He pays the he plays the pathologist that kind of shows up and like, what happened here? Oh, they're all dead. Kind of like scene. <laughs> so let's talk about some iconic moments. We already covered a few, which is the maggots coming through the all window, right. covering everyone, and um, poor Danielle Adora puking her guts out while she sits next to um, future filmmaker Michele Sove, who was right, Fulci's assistant course. director on it. So sure. but, so besides those we've already talked about, I mean, the movie starts off really, really strong. I mean, the credit sequence is that Fabio Frizzy thing, which, again, probably a little bit riffing on that Goblin Dawn of the Dead soundtrack, but it's, like, it's also really, really it's its own thing. It's like, it's a, it's a funeral dirge. No, so, yeah, it's so slow. It's more minimal, I feel. It's almost like Oh, yeah, anyway, slow and minimal. Anyway. Yeah. And then you go to, like, it's basically cross-cut between, like, Katarina McCall's character, who's in this seance, and they're channeling, like, this priest in the town of Dunwich that, by hanging himself, opens one of the gates of hell. She has a freak out at the same time and, like, apparently dies of fright at this seance. Or does, it's, 
or does she? <laughs> We'll is, it, is, it, is it the seance that, it, that opens up the gates of hell, or is it the priest hanging himself? It's, it's, the, the, it's right? the priest, but, but they're like, doing this. But that also makes no sense. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, I, I don't think seances work to, like, basically recall an event that already happened or just recently happened. I, I mean, I, again, like I said, like, the plot on this one is, is just, like, slightly taped together to keep it moving. That's right. when they mentioned not... the book Bybon too, right? Is that the first mention of it? I can't remember. Well, they call it Enoch in this movie. Oh, Enoch. Okay. Yeah, uh, so Gates Ebon is Enoch. Ebon is from the Beyond, which is right. why do you have two very similar name books? It's, a that... it's, it's yeah. a Enoch and New England. It's a regional. <laughs> Down south, they call it Ibon. <laughs> <laughs> up, up north with the Yankees, they call it Enoch. <laughs> So you got you got that, and then Christopher George plays like a newspaper man who clearly is legend. too old. Yeah, he's a legend. He's too he's clearly too old for whatever this role is. <laughs> too old for this shit. <laughs> but it, you know, I appreciate him showing up and smoking a cigar and like being swarmy, looking kind of <laughs> bored and amused through the whole movie. And then the, he goes to the cemetery where Katarina McCall's character is dead and being buried by two two of the laziest fucking grave diggers ever put the ca- put on camera. I need to double check. I think Al Cliver actually is one of the grave diggers in Gates of Hell. Uh, the blonde guy? Yeah, the blonde guy. He's I think the doctor in the beyond, right? He's about yeah, I think that is him and somehow I missed that earlier. I just realized that. I think they make a crack about union rules too, which reappears in the beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, because the union, yeah the union rules is like well it's five o'clock we're done. It's like aren't well, you had a thing against unions? So it's like well, <laughs> you know. I mean, at first keep like, those budgets down. <laughs> keep those budgets down. I mean, it, it's funny because like they're literally on a lunch break. One of them has to go into an open grave and just like kind of dust off a skeleton. Then they decide to kind of like half-ass bury her grave, and then they leave. And then Christopher George is just kind of hanging out in like. That's when Katrina McCall wakes up in a coffin, sort of buried alive. Mm-hmm. And, like, that scene is really, really intense. And, right. like, yeah. Like, it, it's fucking rugged because she's, like, clawing at it, like, breaking the glass because I guess her coffin had a mirror in it. And it just, it's really intense. And then the, to take it up a notch is Christopher George runs, gets a pickaxe, and, like, fucking slams it into the coffin. And why? I mean, it just makes no sense. <laughs> So why are you doing that? You know that's where the person's head is. <laughs> but but you get that near sense of eye violence. I know, right? It's good. It's a great scene. And again, it makes. I mean, I'm cool. I'm totally. I I don't think any of us would be here if we weren't okay with the dream logic of uh, Fulci's movies. You know, if you have a problem with that, you didn't even get this far. You're certainly not going to listen to this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so. I, I am there for every what the fuck moment in his, in his body of work. This is why I appreciate his like zombie quartet because like outside of zombie, they're all just like really weird occult movies that happen to have sort of zombies. None of the, the zombies never act. The, I mean, they're all slow, but they they all operate different in each yeah, movie. Uh, yeah, like we said in Gates of Hell, they teleport. They seem to be psychic, have psychic powers. They do all sorts of shit that zombies aren't supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, this, we already talked about poor Daniel Dor. I, I always keep mentioning, because that, that gut puking scene is just fucking gross. Right, which was induced by a zombie just... It was the priest, right, staring at her, right? Yeah. Staring. like the, <laughs> the, the blood, the tears of blood is so iconic. Yeah, that that it's really great. And then, like, Obviously, they put a bunch of that shit in her mouth, and then, like, at a certain point, you can tell when they cut to the dummy, and they're just, like, shoving, like, massive amounts of fucking, like, sheep guts or whatever it is. Which is awful from a technical standpoint. And, then, again, normal people who enjoy conventionally good films, that <laughs> might, they might not want to cross that line where someone is, is clearly replaced by a, a plastic dummy. But... <laughs> But I feel in Fulci's film, it just kind of adds to that surrealness. It's like it's kind of just another element on top. Everything, you know, on top of kind of layers up this whole, like, otherworldly vibe. I mean, I'll actually 
say this. Like, obviously, you can tell it's clearly a fucking dummy that's no, doing that's the, not that. <laughs> but the way they put it together, it does work. And I think, like, you know, part of you does register that, like, this is obviously a fake effect, but, like, the way it's presented and the way they cut it and all that stuff, it works because, like, you know, it calls attention, but not really because, like, it just feels like one seamless thing. And he also doesn't abuse it. Like, he'll cut back to her with, like, shit coming out of her mouth, clearly, and then they'll cut in the dummy and all that. So it, it works because, like, it's not flawless movie magic because of the budget and all that, but, like, it's... It's pretty top notch in how they pull it off. We should talk about Bob. What yep. is the deal with Bob? What is wrong with Bob? What did what, he do what, to that girl? What What is the deal with him and Bob's? We'll get to yeah. the other Bob mm-hmm. later, but like. Oh yeah, the slightly more notorious Bob. Anyway, yeah. but yeah, but it's just a so. Little... <laughs> so, so we're talking about John Morgan's character who gets the power drill through the head, which is just on a whole other level of fucking gore effect. Yeah. But but the setup to get there, so there's this backstory which is not really too clear. So oh. so John Morgan plays this guy named Bob who's like I can't tell if he's like meant there's like a obviously there's something he's mental on, going on. He's on the spectrum. We don't you, you know, can't yeah. really say. <laughs> but like is he a pedophile? Is he like a I, I they don't really get clear about it. Like, I guess he was just a weirdo that would like hang out with younger kids. And then like, everyone's afraid, like he's a molester, but like, did he, I mean, but then the girl I, is like, well, still she, friends. She's, she's still friends with him. Like, Hey, let's smoke yeah. a joint together. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Like well. there, there's all these girls like hanging out with him, And it's just like, maybe he's just like, he's just a weird guy. And people were just afraid of him because he's weird. Yeah, and then again, this scene—the scene that we're talking about—I feel like really hammers home how little Fulci actually cares about delivering a conventional zombie film. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like this is the biggest murder scene set piece of the movie, and there's no zombies around. No. I, allegedly, Fulci did this scene as a comment on a form of fascism. I don't know what fascism he was commenting on, but like the whole thing is set up like. It, it's ludicrous, but like you just kind of go with it. It's like John Morgan randomly breaks into this house of this girl that allegedly he was caught with that everyone was afraid he was going to molest or do something with. Like, okay, <laughs> that, 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 all right, Bob, that's what you do. And then the girl that years ago, I guess, like they were afraid he was going to do something to was like still friendly with him. It was like, hey, you got to get out of here. My dad will kill you. But before you go, let's smoke a joint. So she pulls out this joint, and then her fucking dad busts in, and, like, he's trying to get away. I forget what happens. I think the dad throws him, and he hits this, hits the switch and turns on the power drill. And I guess any logical, angry dad would just grab someone and put their head into the power drill. I mean, we've all thought it. Some of us are going to be kids. <laughs> but it, it's this ridiculous setup. But the second that that power drill comes on, it's just like, oh. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Like, you just kind of go with it. And, like, I don't did know, Bob, yeah. did Bob could, really? <laughs> oh, go uh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and it really could come from a different movie, other than, you know, the atmosphere and the gore. Like, it, it has nothing to do with the main plot of the movie, with the, the zombies. I guess the implication is that there's some sort of demonic force driving people insane. So maybe the father wouldn't have done that otherwise. But you don't know that. <laughs> it's not very clear <laughs> but but as a gore effect it's like again it's up there with the zo- the eye the eye poking zombie it's just just about as slow that drill takes a long time to get there and when it gets there it's a it's a payoff because it's yeah, just like go away I, I think out of all the effects in the movie, it or out of Fulci's career, it's the most well done because like it does feel the most seamless. It does feel like that they put poor John Morgan's head through a power drill. I, I wonder, did any of these movies get shown in the UK during the eighties? Oh, they were all they were all video. No they were so legendary, and I know yeah. there's thrower who's English is so so obsessed with them. You know, they must have been mythic. Because <laughs> you got to think at that point. Like, in the UK, when, like, the video nasties came down, like, you had a whole, like, realm of a lot of really great films you weren't allowed to see. Sure. And there was other ones that got through, but they were cut. 
So, like, you know, this is why Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw Massacre are, like, so, like, revered by, like, you know, the my British friends who do Beyond Fest because, like, it, it was fucking impossible to see. Oh, wow. But, like, but, yeah, like, I'm sure the UK censors, like, got to that. I'm like, yeah, no. No. Oh, I can, yeah, I can't imagine that all that was left probably of Gates of Hell after the cuts was the fog. It was just, like, 60 minutes. <laughs> fog <laughs> <laughs> so the the last thing we'll talk about which is pretty iconic in the movie it, i would say it's iconic but it's the showdown against the priest at the end when they break into his like crypt and apparently his crypt is a whole underground cavern of all these like dusty and cobweb covered zombies and it's like the showdown but like it's weird because like the payoff doesn't quite work because basically the dude grabs a cross stabs the like preacher in the gut and then he explodes in the fire and all the zombies catch fire it is weird it's a bit the ending is a bit kind of like reminds me of tombs of the blind dead a little bit it's kind of like that like because they have like cloaks and stuff when they show up it seems yeah. really cool it i guess the <laughs> literal, sorry uh, the literal ending of the boy running towards the camera that is uh that's got to be one of the most uh half-assed endings in history like, well i i think that I uh, I believe they uh, actually lost the footage of the end, so then that's what they did, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what's up with that. That's why that is the way it is with the cracked but screen and all that, you know. Yeah, because, because the dreamlike quality of the movie it doesn't ruin it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you get you could tell there's something else supposed to be there because they're like right. all smiling and the kids like running and then like freeze frames is like. And then all right, that, you you, you do kind of go with it. But it, that's that's kind of a shame that like that was gone. But like you know, I think Tombs of Blind Dead is a good reference for that ending. Yeah. But like, it all the ending also kind of feels rushed. And I and I guess we've got to mention like they had to stop the zombies before All Saints Day ended, which is like you know traditionally November first, Day of the Dead, and that kind of stuff. But they don't really go into it. It's like, well, we have this arbitrary day, All Saints Day holiday. We gotta stop them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't, doesn't make a lick of sense. No. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, we're going to talk about more Fulci zombie movies on the Cinematic Void podcast. A beautiful woman inherits a hotel with a dark and sinister secret. A secret it cannot forget. Go back to where you came from and hurry. Despite a series of chilling warnings, she refused to give up on her dream of success. Either I run this hotel... Or I go on relief. Sixty years ago, everybody in this hotel disappeared. This hotel is one of the seven gateways of hell. And when this gate of hell is opened, her dream becomes a living nightmare. The poltergeist takes revenge at the acclaimed theatrical thriller, The Seven Doors of Death. Welcome back. We're still talking Lucio Fulci zombie movies on the Cinematic Void podcast with her friend Matthew Gray. Up next, we're into the third film of the quartet and the second film in Fulci's Gates of Hell trilogy. It's none other than The Beyond, a.k.a. And You Will Live in Terror, The Afterlife, uh-huh. which is a, which is in the Italian tradition of having a movie title too long for its own good. Yeah, a full sentence. Yeah, I know I said that Gates of Hell is, is my personal favorite, but like, you know, I gotta be, The Beyond is his Citizen Kane. The Beyond oh, yeah. is his bona fide, whatever you want to call it, masterpiece. Uh, yeah, I my notes I put down for this. It, this is literally full cheese masterpiece, and I people are probably not going to agree with me on this. I think it's the second best zombie film ever made behind Dawn of the Dead. All right, and I don't, and it's not by much. And they operate on different realms, but like I think this is like he took the nightmare logic of Gates of Hell. He got the plot a little better stringed together, so it was there's a point A, B, and it's not as hodgepodge as like Gates of Hell is, and like he did something completely unique and I think extraordinary when you really think about how ambitious this fucking film is. It's still weird, but like it's, you know, we talked about him being a surrealist. It is a surrealist nightmare logic film, and it, that is just. Overfilled with gore. It's, again, it stars Katrina McCall, 
brings in David Warbeck as the uh, male lead this time. Cynthia Morelli. Anton St. John plays Shrek, the, the zombie that's the most the iconic zombie from the Beyond. And Al Cliver appears again, this time as a doctor in the Beyond. And the but, weird little redheaded girl, whoever she yeah. is. I forget what her. I forgot to write down her name, but we'll, we'll talk about her in a bit. It was, you know, not actually a kid. It's not quite burial ground, but you know, <laughs> she's clearly not, an adult. Yeah, yeah. Not not as bad as Peter Bark playing like a twelve year old kid when he was clearly a thirty year old dwarf. I can't say it's truly my favorite Fulci movie, but I do think it's his best. Film. And you know, I said he basically took the Gates of Hell template and perfected it for this one. And, you know, it, it does have a plot, although it's a stretch of a plot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a haunted house movie at its yeah. core. Yeah. Katarina McCall buys this hotel in New Orleans, trying to renovate it, and all these accidents happen because one of the gates of hell are there. And, yeah, that's all you need. And there's a backstory and weird shit. And, you know, like, like I said, it, it does have a plot, but it does go off the rails which is why it, it also kind of transcends because of that. I, the other thing I think it does with the gore set pieces is where, like, again, with Gates of Hell, there's some really, really great gore set pieces, but, like, again, kind of lightly taped together. These seem to kind of more logically flow one into the other to the other, and it's like an escalation of things. Even if the gore effect isn't, like, bigger each time out, it just, like, there's this... It just feels natural, like, oh... I violence. Oh, tarantula attack. Oh, little girl gets shot in the face. You know, it it all flows together. And even like the little bits of like the exploding glass and David Warbeck shooting zombies and stuff like that. It just it kind of all feels like this natural progression, which is really unique for like a zombie film, let alone any film. Hmm. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, I agree. Uh, I can... I think it's the movie where, like, everything kind of comes together for Fulci. Not that he doesn't have other good movies, but, like, it's definitely the one where, like, everything kind of lines up. Like, the, all the stars aligned from this one. And, it's, and I think, going back to, like, City of the Living Dead, just to, like, not to hammer on it too much, but, I, like, for me personally, I know Fulci has the reputation as kind of, like, you know, the maestro of gore and whatnot. And that's what pe a lot of, uh, historically, I think people have, like, used to like sell in his films and like talk about them but for me it really is the uh, the style and the atmosphere and the surrealism of his movies that keeps me coming back to them like i'm not a straight gore straight up gore guy you know i'm not going to keep coming back watching the same movie over and over again because of gore you know i have no problem with gore obviously otherwise i wouldn't be here but like it's the uh it's really the atmosphere of these movies that keeps me coming back to them that, that i think is so unique and so complicated I, I also kind of feel like this is him, like, really pushing into art house and even more of his surrealist tendencies. Yeah. Like, the, the one key thing is that highway scene where, like, Katrina right. McCall's, like, driving down the highway and runs into the, yeah. into the blind lady with the dog. Yeah. And it, it's, it's otherworldly. And it's like, you know, I know Fulci used to get labeled as a hack and a craftsman. It's like, a craftsman's not coming up with that. Yeah. that, that there's, there's a distinct vision to it. Like, there's, like, thought, because, like, he's setting up this whole, like, dream nightmare world. Yeah. I mean, not to get... I don't want to get too deep into, like, psychologically profiling Fulci or whatever, but it does seem like that's maybe, like, kind of, like, the thing that haunted him. Because, you, you know, he was a true artist underneath it all. Like, he definitely was a true artist, had a true artistic eye and vision, and I think he felt maybe burdened by his career as an exploitation director, which... Ironically, he would have no lasting legacy without that, but, you know, it's complicated. He never really seemed quite comfortable at, with it, you know? I mean, there's part of it, like, he was clearly doing things for money. Yeah. But I also think on top of that is just, like, you know, he knew how to direct a fucking movie, and, like, he definitely knew what visually was going to work. Like, I think the reason why all of his gore scenes are so memorable is, like, yeah, they're gory, but, like, there's a flair to it that, like, you could watch something like Dr. Butcher M.D. or Nightmare City or, like, any of those movies where, like, there's plenty of gore in those, but, like, they're not 
they're not set up as set pieces. It's right. it's something Fulci really did well, and like I think, you know, it's something Argento also does well with right. his or did well during that period. It was just like you be like he could set them up just as well as Argento, and I think. I know we talked about it a little bit earlier. I think that's what always rubbed him raw was because like, hey, I'm doing the same thing. But I also think his tendencies went a little more darker and more violent than Argento did because like when Fulci had someone stabbed, there wasn't a little blood. There was a lot of blood. Yeah, and they would get stabbed again and again and again. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, no, there, there's something a little, you know, Argento. Argento, uh, I just read his biography, by the way. Uh, if you're talking about things we've read lately, I just read Fear. Um, but, you know, let's be honest, Argento's kind of a classy guy. He seems really like, you know, he's a film critic. He seems very, like, you know, eloquent and upper class and into, like, fashion and the high arts. And, you know, and Fulci's down and dirty. He may have these, like, higher, loftier aesthetic ambitions, but he's really down there in the muck. You know, he is not afraid to get dirty. Yeah. Really care about things being more finer or, you know, maybe having the edges, like, kind of defined. He's just like, nope, this is how it's going to be. This is the movie. <laughs> yeah. And there's really nothing wrong with that. Now, um, the thing that really, I think, puts the beyond over the top is I think this is Fabio Frizzi's best score out of all the... I mean, he did other Fulci movies, he did Four Apocalypse, he did The Psychic as well. But, like, I think this is the soundtrack where Fabio, like, I don't know if you can hit more than one home run on the same at bat, but, like, that's pretty much what he did. It's like, home run, ran the bases, and then just, like, hit another home run back-to-back. Like, that, I, I think it's, like, the, his Beyond score is, like, is one of the best scores for any movie let alone an italian horror movie like it 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 kind of gets away from the trappings of like kind of like do something kind of like dawn of the dead i feel yeah, like this not was off anymore now. Yeah. no I, I think he was allowed to just go for it and like it's it's orchestral it's really epic and like kind of really pretty at times yeah it <clears throat> it it goes it goes the full gambit and it's just like that piano Oh. That piano cue that goes throughout pretty much the whole movie, like it kind of just kind of comes in and out. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, it, it's extraordinary. I remember basically having a bootleg VHS of the Japanese laser disc of the Beyond, and I remember hooking my tape deck to my VCR and recording the end of the Beyond so I could have a fucking tape of like that end, the like the end theme because it's like. Because, you know, some soundtracks, though, I think Goblin was one of the first bands that I heard to, like, wow, I want to actually listen to that stuff outside of, like, the movie. Right. Like, U.S. composers, I don't really, outside of maybe John Carpenter, yeah. I don't really, I did, growing up, I didn't feel that needed, like, I want to own that as, like, a piece of music, but, like. Yeah, like, I've never, like, listened to, like, Howard Shore for fun. Yeah. You know, his soundtracks for Cronenberg are great, but I'm not going to, like, be like, hey, it's Halloween, I'm going to put on some Howard Shore. <laughs> you don't do it. You but yeah. Goblin. yeah, I think I gotta say it. Frizzy better than Goblin. Oh, Ooh. I, <laughs> I, I mean, they were like in a, a prog rock band. They weren't really like orchestrators, so he's definitely more diverse in his compositional skills. But uh, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. I just I pre I prefer it. I really do. All right. It's just I don't know. I mean, prog rock, yeah. You know, I guess maybe I'm just not a prog rock guy, but uh, yeah. but I but mean, I appreciate even the prog rock moments of the frizzy stuff. You know, it's great. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's I, I'm 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 sticking by my opinion there. I mean, if I, we're talking movies outside of Suspiria, I'll give you it. But Suspiria is like, I'm gonna just go out and say it's the best horror soundtrack of all time. I put it above Exorcist, above Halloween. That is just nightmare fuel. That music. Yeah. But that's me. You know. I, I'm going to split the difference. I think the Beyond score is way up there. I do think Goblin, maybe as a whole, I like a little bit better because of the band structure. Sure. But I'm going to disagree on Suspiria. I actually think their score for Deep Red's way better than Suspiria. Uh, that's my number two, but yeah, for sure. I mean, it, but it's like, 
it's not even like it's like wide margins for any of this stuff. I think it's all very close because like it's they were just all the frizzy goblin. Actually, you know what? I take it back. Frizzy never wrapped. There was never. <laughs> <a winner. laughs> yep. It, without fail, we're gonna mention the deep red wrap again. Oh. <laughs> well, deep red wrap. I'm not aware of that. That's something to YouTube. Oh. Right Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I this has come up in multiple podcasts. It, this used to be the Black Flag podcast in the early days. Now it's the Claudia Seminetti Project podcast. <laughs> so late 80s, Claudio Seminetti. I I'm sorry we're getting off Fulci track, but like Yeah, we it's, can cut it. I don't know. No, no, no. We don't have to cut it because I feel like I want more people to hear it because I feel like still not enough people know about the deep red rap. Uh, I, I mean, will, do we just do YouTube. we just throw it on the screen and watch it together now? <laughs> no, because it, last time we tried to do it, like it was a train. Yeah, fair. Uh, so, but after this, go look at so late late '80s. Claudio Seminetti puts out a record slash laser disc, like you know, video concert called the Claudio Seminetti Horror Project. It was basically the only way you could see a live concert of Goblin on video, even though it was, like, pretty much the band that became Demonia, which was his, like, metal soundtrack kind of band that he did for a while. So I got this, again, bootleg VHS off the Laserdisc. And I was like, cool, I can, like, watch and listen to these Goblin songs. And kind of, like, a little halfway through, a rap version of Deep Red plays. They bring in... <laughs> They bring out this dude called Dr. Felix. I, I've never I've never heard of him as a rapper. He might be big in Italy. So <laughs> and like they have like a dude playing, you know, doing DJ scratches, but he only has one turntable. They put a hip hop beh beat behind the fucking deep red song. And the guy's like, Deep Red, you're dead. And it's like the most like like the uh, L Cool J song from Deep Blue Sea, where it's like deepest, reddest. My head is a shark then. Oh my god! I never thought about it. We've we've talked <laughs> both these songs, but like, god damn it, that's the precursor of that fucking goddamn the fucking Deep Blue Sea song. Like, it it's on that level. It's he, utterly. He had to he had to kick it up a notch, deeper, redder. Damn. <laughs> but the whole video is ridiculous because like, there's a lot of '80s like graphics effects like you would see on public access like because they had like the effects like oh we'll do a split screen oh we'll do solarized and stuff like that wow. but claudio seminetti bless him has put up each of those songs on his youtube page so oh, proud proud man yeah. after 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 we get done today go look up the deep red rap and now back to lucio folk <laughs> yeah back to back to the maestro <laughs> so well, do we have anything else to say about the beyond uh i think the ending the ending deserves well before we get to the ending we, yeah. we should talk about like out of the this was the first one that there was actually a recut of okay and then gates of hell came out pretty uncut was released unrated same for zombie the beyond ended up being released in the u.s as seven doors of death right it was slightly trimmed like i think most of the gores in there i i used to own the big box vhs but the biggest crime of this version is they took out Fabio Frizzy's score and put in like another soundtrack. Oh man, that's ridiculous. Uh, it might I don't quote me on this. It might be available on the Grindhouse like Blu-ray, like that version. But like it, why? Other than if you're curious. Yeah, I don't know. But my other favorite thing about Seven Doors of Death, they paid Toby Hooper, director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for a quote. Toby Hooper admitted <laughs> years later he's never seen The Beyond. But this oh. is his quote about Seven Doors of Death, a.k.a. The Beyond. A truly original haunted house thriller. <laughs> I can't disagree. <laughs> Actually, I forgot the first part. The, the whole quote is unrelenting excitement. Well, maybe not so much. It's not boring. It's not boring. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I mentioned, if, if we call back to it, I mentioned the... Uh, the Argento back and forth. I, I always felt the dog attack in that was definitely a reference to Suspiria, the dog attack in the beyond. I think they're kind of shot similarly. Like there's definitely like an insert of a dog head puppet mm. in there. But like when her throat rips out and like the geyser just shoots out, you, you <laughs> can just see Fulci's like, that's right, motherfucker. 
Yeah. You think you, think you can kill with dog? I can kill with dog. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, but the end. Yeah, I was gonna say if we if we, it's cool to jump ahead to the ending if I'm not getting too moving too fast. A little but bit because we gotta talk about all the things that get to the ending. All so. right, you go. You're the host. Yeah. You're just like, let's just hurry this shit up. I want to watch the Deep Red rap. Exactly. A couple of other things. Um, I did program this on 420 last year. It was part of a triple feature of Army Darkness and Waxwork, which had to do with movies that you had to step through portals to other universes, which does play into the ending, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And, of course, we got to mention the Fulci cameo, where he plays the librarian and also talks about union issues again. Of course, yeah. My favorite Fulci cameo. <laughs> And they, I like they dubbed him with like this like southern fried like <laughs> like gentleman voice. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm getting too ahead. We didn't even talk about the spiders. Oh, oh wow. so what, let's this go. Gonna the... be, this is going to be your first three hour episode. I hope you're okay with that. Man, we're going for it. We're fucking going for it. <clears throat> but so iconic moments. We got to start with Shrek, who's the painter that's in room 36. Three sixes, six six six. Oh, good joke, good joke. <laughs> uh, basically, the, the opening of the film, which is shot in sepia tone, which is an artistic choice. I know, like, you, there are versions where you can see it in color. So basically, Schweck, who's this painter that's like fucking around with like opening gates of hell, they come. This posse comes for him. And they fucking start beating him with chains, <laughs> and not just beating him with chains. Like every chain hit tears tears off a fucking chunk of flesh. Yeah, and again, the sound effects are amazing. They're like, I don't know. They, there's a scene like that in Don't Torture a Duckling, too. Yeah, that, I, I think that was the precursor. So I think Fulci is like, now that I got a little bit more money and a little more like, no, time let's, really, dudes. Yeah, Let, let's really destroy the human body. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fucking painful. Because yeah. it's just like, it's like, basically, it's what Mel Gibson tried to do in Passion of the Christ, but failed miserably. That bring up this much anguish in someone getting whipped, and then they, and then <laughs> they fuck. Shrek, Shrek is it's Shrek, right? Yeah, Shrek. He's like Shrek, German. Shrek. Not Shrek, not the Green Ogre. No. And what we're saying is Shrek. Shrek is really a Christ figure, is what you're saying. Well, they do crucify him. I guess so. Yeah, he's 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 a bit of a messianic figure. Yeah, yeah they they crucify him. He's got his head like just like Jesus. That which also brings a point that like Fulci didn't like the Catholic Church. Like, I guess he was raised Catholic, and he's like, I fucking hate this. Which course, explains, it would be, yeah. Which explains, don't torture a duckling <laughs> at the highest. I know he's made religious jokes in his sex comedies as well. But, like, this is just, like, pretty much open mockery. <laughs> if you want to get down to it. So they have poor Shrek crucified, then they throw, like, I don't know what it is on him. Like, concrete, some kind of, like, hot oatmeal-looking shit. And they're just, like, yeah. throwing it on him. <laughs> plaster of paris i don't know <clears throat> who knows yeah, he's messed up and then they bury him behind a wall right yeah <laughs> in a basement of this hotel so there is a little gore scene that ha it's not really a gory scene but like there's a guy that falls off a scaffolding when he sees the blind girl upstairs and like he falls and like apparently when you fall in a fulci movie you just like start vomiting blood immediately I, I I think research wise, I could be wrong. I think the guy that played the guy that fell off the scaffolding that was painting the house was the New Orleans film commissioner at the time. So they probably <laughs> they probably worked out a deal. It's like, hey, can we get a deal? We'll put you in this movie. Want to cough up a lot of blood for no reason? It is kind of amazing as a slight digression. Like I think people like a lot of times they'll look back on these movies and be like, they were so low budget, they were so cheap looking, but like there was a freedom to like location shooting that movies had back then that movies nowadays don't have like movies no. now they're so much like tighter and like more confined where they're allowed to shoot like you know like the most thing that comes to mind would be like the Suspiria remake which maybe some of those decisions were aesthetic and I like the Suspiria remake it, but uh, to me it looks cheaper than the original it looks like it had a lower budget <laughs> than I, our shows film, you know? And I feel like a lot of these movies, like The Beyond, like a movie, to shoot a film like The Beyond nowadays, people talk about it being cheap. You wouldn't be able to do that for under 10, 20 million nowadays. Oh, no. I mean, 
the movie has production value and like even the stuff they shot in Rome clearly like the library scene and that kind of stuff like there's production value to it and it looks good like they when the Italians went to like the US and like cherry picked like weird locations cuz they, they seem to have themes like sometimes they would be in Boston sometimes to be in New York like there'd be tons of productions but like they actually do capture a good bit of New Orleans in it and they and Fulci does it well. You get to see like the cemeteries there. You get to see like, you know, Bourbon Street or whatever. Like it he really utilizes it. It's like they could have literally shot it anywhere, but it's like, no, this takes place in New Orleans. We're gonna make it look and feel like New Orleans. So when we get to those interiors that are obviously shot in Rome, it's gonna still feel like New Orleans. Yeah. And the modern horror movies with a similar budget are like, we're gonna shoot it in a room in the woods. <laughs> I, I I feel like the laziest horror movie move now is like it takes place at a cabin by a lake. Yeah. Oh, you went to you went to fucking Big Bear for a weekend. Congratulations. <laughs> we did, and it cost more than the beyond. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not really blaming the filmmakers. It's more capitalism, I think I'm <laughs> I also I also feel like at a certain point horror films got la- less ambitious. I'm not I'm not speaking as a whole because I'm sure there's a lot, but like I know at least on the indie side and people that make movies, like there is a pressure to have like as few locations as possible because locations cost money. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Italians were like, I mean, I'm sure they paid for stuff. I'm also sure they went and stole as many fucking shots as they could before they got sure. called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I'm sure they didn't get permits for that bridge shot. No, <laughs> they just like, all right, hurry up and do that. So back to the beyond and Fulci's love of eye violence comes Joe the plumber who <laughs> accidentally great Fulci character. <laughs> yeah. Joe the plumber, like he go, like he walks in the house and lights a cigarette. I mean, I guess it was the eighties and you could just yeah. freely smoke anywhere. <laughs> he's just like, where's the leak basement. Okay. So he's like walking in this like water with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And then like he finds the hole and he's just like, Pulling off, it's like clay, and then Schweck's head, hand comes out, and like basically puts enough pressure to pop an eyeball out. The first of a few eye damages in this movie. I think. Oh, it, it, you know, it it n- none of the eye violence in this one probably reaches the the euphoria of zombies no. eye splinter eye bit, but like the amount of it is just like it's commendable because like they're all pretty extreme. It's just like oh fuck because I mean eye violence is just visceral. Yeah. I think, but. Besides teeth, if Fulci had also capitalized on teeth, like... I remember reading, a, it might have been Men, Women, and Chainsaws, a famous feminist study of slasher films. I don't know if you've read that or not, but... Uh, I haven't read that one, but I'm aware of it. But I, I think it's that one. It could be someone else, but I think, I, 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 I think I'm referencing that, uh, talking about injury of the eye being symbolic of fear of castration. And uh, I was like, no, just getting your eye poked out is fucking bad. <laughs> that's already bad, you know? It's like, that's not cool. That's not necessarily preferable. I'm not voting for castration, but, you know, if you had to make a choice, it's, it's, that's a hard choice to make. I mean, I two of each, so you could, I'd do one of both if I had to choose. <laughs> half castration, yeah. half eye pop. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Again, the way Fulci, like, paces out for each war scene, like, they might not always top each other, but, like, they're logical. So it comes to the morgue acid bath where, like, Joe's wife shows up, and I guess, like, they don't give a fuck in New Orleans, or maybe this is just an Italian custom. I don't know. Like, (laughs) you're in the morgue, and you start dressing your dead husband for his burial, and it's just like, don't you have to wait for him to leave? Don't they do that at the funeral home? It's like, nope, got to put him in a suit now. <laughs> Save time. <laughs> and then she gets freaked out because um, I think she runs a Schweck who's like also there because they found that body. And she, she passes out on the ground. Meanwhile, her daughter, whose name is Jill, who looks like Pippi Longstockings, rushes in. Or the Sarah- Wendy's girl. I was thinking, yeah. like, looking like the Wendy's girl. Yeah, same reference. Close yeah. enough. So she runs in and just sees this fucking glass vat of acid which i'm not sure why they have that in war i guess i guess they kind of need to dissolve stuff just pour in our mom's face and it, it just like it just goes yeah <laughs> and, she, and the girl jill you said the little girl she she does nothing during this whole scene she just stands there <laughs> watching 
which maybe that's what you do. I mean, who can judge someone in that situation? So, so, so <laughs> not a whole lot you can do about it, you know. It's like, well, I mean, I mean, you could you could have moved your mom. You could have moved her. You could have got someone. You could have just stopped watching, like closed the door and back away slowly. You you could have you could have slapped the fucking acid and po- had the pouring another way. No, just let the whole and yeah. it was endless. <laughs> It's just like so much acid, and just like it went through like every layer of skin, bone, eye, everything. Didn't affect the tile of the floor or anything. So no, was... no. I mean, it, it that that's medical grade like tile. Yeah. That it, that apparently doesn't burn from acid, but like, <laughs> I mean, it, it's utterly ridiculous and amazing all at once. Yeah. But it it's also pretty original because like I I think at this point we're. Fulci, either think of Romero or like what Savini was doing in various fi- in other films. Like, how do I top? How do I top everyone else? <laughs> what what thing can I do that no one else has done yet? Because like, there's only so many ways you can stab, bite, mutilate someone. I mean, I would say this probably is, uh, of its time, maybe the most. Gore, the goriest film of its time, at least until Evil, the Evil Dead movies and then Dead Alive come out later. But for its time, I, I can't think of anything pre or com, com, contemporary of the Beyond that, that that is quite this gory. I mean, there's gory movies, but like to be consistently gory, which is something yeah. a lot of movies don't do. Like they usually have one or two like big set pieces, where this is like a lot of set pieces that are really gory and it just, it just links. Keeps- so from one ridiculous set piece, we move to <laughs> probably, I don't want to, it probably is the most famous bit in the movie, which is the library tarantula attack scene. Sure. Which is like, so basically this guy that's helping um, Katrina McCall, like, you know, renovate her, this hotel, he goes and looks up paperwork on, this is where Folgie's cameo is. So this guy's crime, climbing up this ladder, finds this book, discovers like, that the hotel's sitting on one of the gates of hell. All of a sudden, lightning, like a thunder crash and lightning strikes, and the guy falls off this ladder in this library, and he's laying there, like, can't move, and then fucking tarantulas just start rolling up on him. I mean, that's what happens, like you said, when you fall in a, in a Fulci movie. Yeah. Just you're, instant paralyzation. It's not. like, you could fall off a chair, and you're just, like, paralyzed in a Fulci movie. I mean, I don't know if it's that far, but, like... Clum- clumsy people have no chance. No, you're done. Much like the maggots in City of the Living Dead, and the dog in this movie, it's uh, yeah, it's just animals go crazy. There's just a general sense. I don't know if we've talked about that. We talked about the surrealism, but there's just a general sense I feel in Fulci's movies, at least this trilogy. Uh, well, not zombies so much, but this trilogy that the world itself is evil. Oh yeah, the world itself is everything around you is sinister and wants to kill you, and he's not wrong. <laughs> There's, there's always like strange kind of like animal sounds going on in the background. Yeah. And it, like, uh, I feel like there's one of them. It, I, and I totally could be wrong, but there's one that had like a, you know, like monkey sounds or something that wasn't zombie. It wasn't the one that took place like in the fucking jungle. Oh, it, it, it was like, of, you know, it's, right. It's, it's, it's gates of hell. Yeah, for sure. Where like all of a sudden they're like, they're, I think they're going into the underground crypt or like they're in the cemetery and all of a sudden there's like chimpanzee noises. Yeah. I'm like, I, I, I don't know if like they're like I want what some animal sounds like this is what we got and they're just yeah, like got record. <laughs> but speaking of weird sound effects, the tarantulas all sound like like squeaky tricycles, like kid tricycles as they're walking yeah. towards. And it, it's comical, but it's also really eerie. And then when they I mean, finally if you're get afraid to... of spiders, it's probably a little rough. Right, like the spiders like... was enough. You didn't even have to add the fucking noise. <laughs> when they get there, they start ripping this guy apart, and, like, obviously there's a couple, like, hand puppet tarantulas that are, like, snuck in there with the real ones. They're doing, like, most of the heavy lifting or the brutalizing. Yeah, the spiders look mm-hmm. pretty disinterested. Yeah. <laughs> and with the spiders, more eye trauma. Yeah. yeah. More eye trauma. Like, one of, like, at least four in the movie, right? Because there's also Joe the Plumber's girlfriend or whatever gets her eye gouged out. Oh, uh, the housekeeper that's, like... I... There's a housekeeper and there's the housekeeper's assistant in the beyond and like I I don't know what the fuck they're actually doing. I guess they're just there they came with the they came with the hotel 
and they just seem to be like dragging their feet so they can't finish anything. Well, you know, it's what they're used to. I don't know. It's, it has <laughs> been for a long time. It's funny, yeah, because they may or may not all be ghosts, but at the same time, they still get murdered. You know, it, like it doesn't really matter in the Fulci movie. And then also, uh, maybe jumping ahead, but the little redhead girl also gets her eye blasted out. Yeah. <laughs> Quite memorable special effect. There may be yeah. more eye damage in the movie I'm not remembering, but uh, that's four right there for one movie. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it, none of them reach zombies' eye splinter, but, like, there's a lot of fucking nasty eye trauma. It's like... <laughs> It's okay to be, like, second place the zombie with the amount of stuff that's happening in there. So, um, we, we just talked about, we talked about the housekeeper's reverse eye pop, where basically she, Fulci figured out a different way to cause eye trauma, where he, like, he backs the housekeeper's face into a nail, one of the nails that Schweck was crucified on, funny enough, and, like, goes through her, like, back of her head and pushes her eyeball out. It's almost like a 3D effect. It's it it it's like the eyeball pop in Friday Thirteenth Part Three, but not as corny. <laughs> yeah, no, it's. I mean, if you're, I know I said earlier that I am a fan of the the atmosphere and surrealism of Fulci's movies, but uh, more than the gore. But if you're a fan of gore, you you, you can't do a lot better than than, than the Beyond. You're not going to be let down. <laughs> And we already kind of talked about the the dog attack a little bit. So, I mean, the blind girl's obviously a ghost. And I guess the... Murder. She's still I don't, well, like, I, don't, I don't know about obviously. I don't know if any of the plot stuff in any of these movies are obvious ever. Impl- implicit. <laughs> right, like, I guess, I'm like, there were parts where I'm like, yeah, I guess she's a ghost. Right. Wait, is she not a ghost? Wait, what? she's a ghost again. Fuck me. Yeah. Because <laughs> clearly she she doesn't exist anymore. Because when David Warbeck went to go visit her, it's like no one's lived in that house for like hu- like mm. hundred years or some shit. Right, right, right. But clearly, <laughs> clearly ghosts can have their throats ripped out by their seeing eye dogs. So, in the culture universe, you know, not even ghosts are safe from murder. <laughs> <laughs> it's safe to say. And then we we were just talking about Jill, aka the Pippi Lock long stocking looking girl who gets gunshot in the face because she runs in the Schweck and like I guess she gets possessed and she's evil, but like she's okay to go to her parents' funeral and then has the whited out eyes and then like she seems okay for a little bit, but then she turns on him and, and then David Warbeck just like whips around, just blows her fucking face off. I suppose it's probably quick aside to mention David Warbeck's original method of loading guns oh yeah there there, <laughs> there the is goofs yeah. in a movie, which have a lot of them but like well he did it intentionally because he thought he knew no one's gonna notice so <laughs> i don't know if you know about this nick but like there's a scene where david warbuck gets in an elevator and he's fucking around he starts trying to load the bullets into the barrel of the gun like, like he's awesome taking in the no, i did not catch that <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> and um Katarona like actually starts laughing in the take as the elevator doors like shut because she catches them doing it and like that's the take they put in there. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, that might be the bullet he shoots the redheaded girl with. Who knows? I can't remember. I think it's yeah. after. I think it's before. I think he already shot her at that point. But I, I mean, it might as well be the magic bullet to kill JFK at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah, the ending of the Beyond, uh, everything just turns into complete chaos. Like, and, basically, hell on earth. Yeah, it, it's in the hospital. Poor Al Cleaver gets a bunch of glass thrown on him. And, and like, actually, what? He might get some in the eye, so that might be another eye. Actually, yeah, he does. <laughs> there's there's definitely a piece of glass in his eye, and then his blood, sure. and then his face just starts shooting blood. And then, to take the surrealism to its logical conclusion, is there Warbeck, David Warbeck and um, Katarina McCall are trying to get out of the hospital and they end up back at the hotel the and then, and they get in the basement and then they end up in, um, Schweck's painting. The one he was painting the day he was killed and they look around, they're trapped in it. And it's just like, it's one of those things like, how does this even work? But then it also makes complete fucking sense. Yeah. I mean, some people might be mad at it, but again, they might not have even made it that far, but I think it's a great ending. Oh, I, I think it, it's a fantastic en- ending because it's just like you're in, you're, they're trapped in a nightmare and there's no way out. Now they're just running in the painting and their eyes are whited out. And then that frizzy cue drops and it's just like, 
fuck, what did I just watch? I need to immediately watch it again because this is amazing. I think I literally, I'm pretty sure that when I first watched the Beyond, I re after the credits ended, I rewound and watched the ending again because it was just like, holy fuck, this is just amazing. And I couldn't even comprehend why it was amazing because there's the quotes like, the sea of darkness thing. I forget what the actual line is. I should have looked it right. up. And then like when the beat drops, it's just like, holy shit. That's how you end a fucking movie. It definitely makes up for uh, gates of hell. Having that, uh, sort of, uh, yeah. Ending. I'd say it's the best ending of, of Fulci's films. And they all have pretty bleak endings as I've been saying, but that one is just like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> You're doomed. I mean, it, it, for all eternity. And, you know, I actually think it's a damn good movie or a damn good ending for any movie, really. I mean, yeah, like, let's put it at the end of every movie. <laughs> it's just like, can you imagine if Chinatown, if like, forget it, Jake, it's, it's Chinatown and fucking Jack Nicholson's now stuck in the Beyond painting? Like, literally, that's how you make every movie better. Right? Why not? Ending a Terminator, <laughs> they're stuck in the painting. Yeah, and the Jurassic the Park. Up and then the yeah. Paint. <laughs> <laughs> Terminator 2 he's like he just goes down into the painting yeah we now move on to the final film in Fulci's zombie quartet it's I actually think it's probably the, the most interesting of the four it's definitely the most unique it's House by the Cemetery again stars Katrina McCall Paula Malco Anna Peroni legendary Dagmar Lassner Giovanni De Neva as Dr. Freudstein and Giovanni Frizzi as Everyone's favorite kid, Bob. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, just start off, that I really think the uh, calling this a zombie movie right off the bat is debatable. It's <laughs> really more just a monster movie. Well, yeah. Is Freudstein, is, is Freudstein a zombie? Is he something else? Freudstein? Um, I don't know. It's not clear cut. But we'll it's just not, throw it in. We'll throw it into the quartet. I mean, they Fulci, I guess, included it with his Gates of Hell trilogy. And that's basically the the loose tie-in. I, I think a lot of people count it, even though, like, I do agree. Because, like, if it's a zombie movie, there's only one zombie. And apparently, he's a doctor. He knows how to dissect people to get their blood so he can stay alive. He He's the evolved zombie. He's the bub. <laughs> He's the bub of the <laughs> Fulci zombie universe, except he's more functional because he can do a lot more. Sure. You know, I mean, he's kept a house for how many years? <laughs> and gone pretty, much, gone pretty much undetected killing people in the basement. Oh. And no one really knew. Another I mean, movie that could be called a haunted house movie, too. I, I, I actually think it is definitely, this one definitely operates more like a haunted house movie than maybe the, even the beyond because the beyond you kind of get out in your different locations where there's more right. zombies, ghosts or whatever. I mean, this is, it's not really a single location, but it's a primary location, which is that house. Um, it's definitely the weirdest of the four. And, but I also think that's what makes it unique for a lot of things because it definitely, it pushes more of the supernatural agenda. I mean, not to say the beyond doesn't, and Gates of Hell don't have supernatural moments because clearly how else can a zombie teleport and crush a brain? But like <laughs> this, this is it's almost more grounded. And it's I feel quiet, weird. Is yeah. it, can you call a movie like House by the Cemetery quiet? I'm gonna call it a quiet movie. It, it's quiet and it's grounded, and like I feel weird using it. It's yeah. a melancholy movie. Yeah, it, it really is. It's like it it's also really the saddest and darkest of the four. And we'll kind of get into that there so you know some things i just kind of took away as i was watching i actually finished watching it a couple hours before we started this podcast because like i i really wanted to try to watch all four of these before going into it the the weirdest thing that happens in the movie is the babysitter Anne <laughs> is is cleaning up after foisting kills someone and acts like it's nothing like there's a whole <laughs> fucking pile of blood on the wall on the floor and she's just like mopping it up and just like whatever She's kind of in the same lineage as the uh, are they ghosts, are they not, housekeepers of the beyond. Yeah. Because even though she may be a ghost and a servant of Freudstein, she still gets murdered. You know, there's no... You know, being it, a ghost, it, it, yeah, it doesn't protect you. It does not protect you. 
I mean, is she really covering up for him, or is she just like got an OCD that she's cleaning up? But then, like, <laughs> Katrina McCall's character just kind of rolls in there and is like, hey, what's up? Oh, I made coffee, and just like disregards there's just fucking blood everywhere on the floor. Yeah, I guess I thought of her as being like more of a supernatural character because of the uh, mannequin, right? That looks like her. Yeah, because oh. in, the be- in the beginning, like, the ghost girl who apparently can go to town and like look at things, the ghost girl who's like, I guess, the da- Freudstein's daughter. Goes right. to town and sees a mannequin head falls off that was decapitated that foreshadows and the babysitter's death. Right. I I mean, yeah. I mean, the ghosts are having visions. Like this is how fucking weird and deep full she gets. It's like your ghosts are having paranormal visions. Exactly. The, the ghosts are like that's weird. <laughs> so I I'm gonna say we can debate if Freudstein's a zombie or not. I I think as a single zombie movie where he's the only zombie or monster like he's pretty iconic like he has a very unique look oh, that yeah. like he's wearing like a weird like I guess union officer jacket for some reason <laughs> and you know his face is like weirdly mangled it it's it's, he it's really... eyes, right? he has no eyes but then there's those shots when bob's in the basement where you can see the eyes in the dark <laughs> I okay I, I mean like i said this is the weirdest <laughs> of the fucking four um, I, the gore effects, the movie is gory, but I don't think it's the same as the beyond yeah. by any stretch there. I mean, I don't want to use the term restrained because it's really not restrained at all when we get into yeah. the, like the iconic moments, but like it, it, it's not, it's not the same like impact of like elevation that the beyond or even gates of hell are doing. Like they just, they feel, they feel natural, but they are like. I think it's just the melancholy tone that just like takes them to a different place. And I mean, like I said, the movie's dark and like, it, you know, Katarina's character is like basically a mom who's popping pills. And like, there's the scene where like her husband comes back from his trip to New York or wherever. And she's like sleeping in bed and you see like all these pills like spread out on their bedside like table. And it's just like, God, this is fucking dark. It's like the mom's a pill popper. The dad's like, running around not really pay attention and then i mean but if you had bob as your kid you might have to be that way i mean bob i don't i, I don't i, I, I get, we we need to be fair because we can't really speak to the actual little boy playing bob what his characteristics as an as an italian actor would have been he's he's a little annoying looking uh with the hair and all but like it's really <laughs> the dubbing it's the dubbing that yeah the, the bob bob Barry. Bob it Bob is clearly dubbed by a woman <laughs> doing a kid's voice, which they do in cartoons <laughs> all the time, but like it just it it translates weird in this and just like I think Bob has a lot of things going against them. It also doesn't help that like the amount of times the word Bob is said in the movie. My wife is like, How many fucking like, times are, <laughs> like how many fucking times are they gonna say Bob in this movie? It's like you could have a drinking game with this movie. It's like take a shot when they say Bob. You're gonna be fucking shit faced. You're not gonna finish the movie. Because they say at least forty times in that first ten minutes. And then like you got another like seventy six minutes of them <laughs> asking where Bob's at. What's Bob doing? Where's Bob? Hey Bob. It's yeah. literally the only line of dialogue is <laughs> the name Bob. I will say uh also I feel one thing to the detriment at House by the Cemetery, which uh is it has the least interesting leading man of the four. Because they didn't spring for the uh, the outside, like, you know, over-the-hill actor to, to be the lead in this one. He's a little boring, that guy. He actually plays a similar character in New York Ripper as, like, a psychiatrist, where he's equally as dry. But, like, he's definitely way drier in this one. Yeah, I mean, Catriona McCall is great as always, but uh, but that guy's a little whatevs. But I, I, yeah, I mean, I think how's I kind of agree. I, I think maybe we agree. I think House by the Cemetery is kind of unfairly maligned as the weakest of the four, and I don't think that's fair at all. I think it's a very, I think it's one of Fulci's strongest films, and I would rank it above Zombie myself. But uh, yeah, I mean, if I guess we can talk about this now. How do you rank the four? Well, I guess uh, I, I stated that Gates of Hell was my personal pa- favorite, even though I agree with you. I don't think it's the best. There's just something about it that i kind of like it's got like real 
grubby lo-fi quality to it. I don't know. There's something about the atmosphere of that movie. Maybe it's because I'm from New England. I don't know. I like I like the atmosphere of that movie, but I, I don't think it's the best. Beyond's the best, unquestionably. And then, you know, I think House by the Cemetery is uh, right up there. I think, I think for me, Zombie is a little... Maybe it's because they were, he was still trying to like make a movie like Dawn of the Dead, even though it's not that similar, but maybe it's, it's a little more, it seems weird to say about a Fulci movie, but it's a little more generic than the other three. That's always been, that's kind of always how I felt about Zombie after I saw the other three. Yeah. But if I'm going to talk about my order, I'd like, I, you know, I got to put Beyond as number one. I think it's, again, I said it's the second best zombie movie and I'm sure people are going to be like, there's no fucking way you can say that. There's this, this, that. <laughs> I, I I, think it's, like, very close to Dawn of the Dead. I know it operates on a completely different level, but, like, at a uniqueness and originality, I put The Beyond as number one. I put House by the Cemetery as number two because I think it's it's going a different path. It's doing a lot of things really original. And I put Zombie at three. Zombie used to be four, but after re-watching all four back-to-back, I have a new appreciation for it. And I think it's it's definitely the structurally it's the most like normal i guess yeah but i feel like he sets up a lot of things and he delivers and it's just like i think he he basically i think i i have this theory about some directors when they need a comeback movie or the they they get a job and like i need to nail it out of the fucking park because i want to keep working like argento kind of had that with deep red because he made a comedy five days in milan that fucking tank so he's like i need to step up and, and reclaim something so he did deep red sam raimi did a movie called crime wave which didn't do very well so he's like i need to step up and elevate shit so he does evil dead 2 i think zombie is kind of like that for fulci where he's like i need to do something so i can still have a career because otherwise i'm gonna like go into italian television or not work because i think he was pretty poor when he did zombie like he was he needed the money so i think he had this like need to like do something that made a statement. Right. Gates of Hell is last, and it's not really that far off from Zombie. I just think, like, structurally, it was just like, in a weird way, Gates of Hell was a cash in on Zombie, and Fulci was starting to try different things, and, like, they didn't all work, but it set the stages for him to, like, perfect in the beyond. All right, Nick, where do you rank I, your Fulci's? I, I, uh, I would go, of course, Beyond is first. Same with you guys. Um, it's it's incredible. But uh, I, I'm actually going Gates of Hell second. It's just fucking crazy. Um, and then, same as Jim here, I just have a new appreciation for Zombie. So I think I'll put Zombie at three. No offense to House of the Cemetery, but it just it only ends up being four because of the other three. You know, it's just it is what it is. It's great. It's great. It's great as well. You know, yeah. you're, you're not you're not in last place, buddy. You're everything's yeah. okay. You know, yeah. I, I put before, <laughs> like the fourth best of the first four Black Sabbath albums, but it's still a great album. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean that that's actually the best comparison. It's like. Fulci basically made his version of the first four Black Sabbath albums. <laughs> And it's like there's no there's really no wrong answer. Although I do think the beyond is maybe I'm trying to think what the what what would be the beyond comparison to the Sabbath albums? I guess it'd be Paranoid, which I know some well, people like Paranoid because it's overplayed, but it's also the one where I think it kind of sets the uh, the template. Zombie would be the first album, obviously, if we're gonna make these comparisons. And I and I think Master of Reality would be the, uh, the City of the Wall. Yeah, Gates <laughs> of Hell. And yeah, and volume four would be House by the Cemetery. I think that works. Yeah. We'll go with that. All right. Back to House by the Cemetery. So we've, we've, been, we've been talking about Bob, and like I do think the dubbing doesn't do him any favors in this movie because, you know, you do. I, I remember the first time I saw House by the Cemetery, and I was actually rooting for Bob to die. <laughs> And, yeah. and I specifically remember the scene when Freudstein's holding his face against the door when his dad's trying to bust it open the axe, which kind of right. is a call back to, like, Gates of Hell and the pickaxe and the coffin. It's like, come on, man, fucking chop Bob's face off. <laughs> but I, over the years, I've kind of softened my, like, stance on Bob. I, th- I, think, I think Bob's cool. I, I don't know if I'd say cool, but... <laughs> 
you get used to it by the the you know third or fourth viewing. <laughs> I think if you know what Anyway, you me the wrong way. Sorry, if sorry to interrupt. You watch House by the Cemetery at least five or six times, you might start liking Bob. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't love Bob, but I, I've grown in appreciation for him because, like, essentially Bob's got to carry the movie because yeah. out of everyone, he's the only one that lives, I think. Maybe. Yeah, not really. <laughs> I don't think anyone lives. I mean, that, that's my reading. I mean, thing. Yeah, because I mean, let's let's talk about the ending a little bit. I know we're jumping ahead before the iconic moments, but like the ending is like it's actually weirder than the Beyond because like they're yeah. in the basement, the 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 get out of the basement, they have to climb up this fucking ladder to crawl through a tombstone or like a grave that's on the ground. That's normal yeah. in New England. Yeah, <laughs> a lot but, of houses. <laughs> <laughs> So Bob gets out and he gets pulled out by Freudstein's wife and daughter's ghost, and then they just kind of walk off. So, I mean, did Bob die? Was Freudstein real? I don't know. I don't know if anyone's attempted to make like a psychological reading of uh, Fulci's films. I certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, because really you, you don't want to, I don't know what you do once you got to New York Ripper. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, I, like I said, this is I, I think this also set up the stages for Manhattan ba- Baby, where he just doubled down on like this weird, like supernatural. I don't I don't want to say goofiness, but like it is a little bit goofy. But like it's also really unique because it's like who the fuck else is going to take this movie in this direction? Uh, I mean, it's really it's a gothic house by the cemetery. It's really, yeah. really a gothic movie. Yeah, it, it, it is kind of throwback to like those early Italian gothic horrors like. Black Sunday and stuff like that. Maybe not as like dramatic, but like right. more of the the rural modern yeah. take of it, as opposed to like sixteen hundreds witch witch hunting days or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely like the most goth. I mean, I think I think all of the, the Gates of Hell trilogy, they're all a little gothic in that term. In that re- not not in the uh, you know Susie and the Banshees term, but in the like, <laughs> oh sort of you know goth. So they're all they're all pretty gothic. Those three movies, I would say, yeah. So, a couple more notes on House before we go to its iconic moments. Some of which we already covered. The U.S. trailer, I think, is one of the best trailers ever cut. The one that's voiced by Brother Theodore. The one is like, due to the graphic nature nature of this film, no one under seventeen will be admitted. And he's like, House by the cemetery. <laughs> like that trailer is like fucking awesome actually any trailer that brother theodore did the voice for is like a banger but like that house by a cemetery one is fucking perfect uh a unique fact about this movie when it first came to vhs when they did the scan and put it together i guess they put a couple of the reels out of order so the movie already is hard making sense oh so imagine watching it where like reels are out of order and just being like the fuck is going on here <laughs> like I don't I don't know I, I'm assuming it had to be middle reel so it wasn't like the ending plate or something like that I, I'm guessing maybe it was like somewhere around 2, 3, and 4 got swapped around yeah. and by the nature of the movie could you really tell <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know yeah there's definitely like we said the still questions still questions that will never be answered about House by the Cemetery like as I mentioned earlier uh how did how is that bat so full of blood? <laughs> I, I don't know. So uh, the the house in House by the Cemetery was actually used again by Umberto Lindsay for Ghost House about maybe six or seven years after the fact. And something I'm kind of sad to admit because it's in Massachusetts and I used to drive to Salem all the time. I've never stopped on a side trip to go see that house, and it's well, still there. I know. Uh... Megan went to New Orleans uh, a couple years ago without me, and she took a picture to send me where she's standing in front of the house from the beyond. <laughs> a little jealous. But it's apparently it's like a historic home down there because it's you know really old. I mean, I don't think they have a plaque or statue of Lucio or anything there, but uh... they should. I mean, it, if they have a plaque by the roller coaster and roller coaster where Sparks played at, <laughs> there should be a plaque for the beyond by that house. Right. 
in New Orleans, and the same for the house by the cemetery. And lastly, since we've been talking about all his cameos, Fulci appears again, this time pretty early on, when he's talking to Paolo Malco's character in New York, kind of going over what they're what he's researching, which is what's going on at the Freudstein house. But iconic moments. Again, poor Daniela right. Doria gets a right. knife in the head. Right. Side note, how great a name is Freudstein for the monster? It's like... Classic. It's one of those things that's so dumb, it's genius. Oh, it is. It's like... It, 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 it makes him sound like a respected doctor. <laughs> and maybe in another life he was. But yeah, as we mentioned before, Daniel Doria gets it again with a knife in the head in this movie. And it, that, I want to say that's the standout effect in the movie. Like yeah. the way it edited, set up everything. Like, it's perfect. Um, we've already mentioned the bat attack. Which is like it's a tour de force because like that bat is like there's Roll nothing real yeah there's nothing realistic about that bat. <laughs> I feel like the first stab would have been enough to kill it. It really seemed like they literally just got that at like a toy store, like and day day <laughs> of. Like they lost the affecting when it got. So for those of you who haven't seen House by the Cemetery, they they the basement where Froystein lives in has been like sealed off. They break into it. They go downstairs. Katrina McCall gets attacked by his bat, gets in her hair. Then her husband gets attacked by the bat that bites his fucking hand. And he, he's, like, punching in. He's trying to get it off his hand. It won't come off. He goes upstairs. He gets a knife. He stabs it. It's just bleeding everywhere. And he just keeps stabbing. Like, the bat, th this should have been over with in, like, two seconds. <laughs> but, like, it goes on for what feels like five minutes of him, like, just stabbing this bat, blood everywhere. They get blood on poor Bob. Like, he, like, pulls the knife out and just blood gets sprayed on Bob. It's it's sublimely ridiculous. I wouldn't say it's the best effect in Fulci's canon, but, like, it's memorable because they it is. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking ridiculous. Uh, a couple other things when, like, they find the cassette tape from that other doctor who previously lived at Freud's student's house going over what Freud's name been up to. They show the blood creeping out of that weird tomb or gravestone that's in the middle of the house. And then you go down to Freud's student's basement. You see all the bodies hanging up and all the body parts cut up of what he was doing. It's really creepy. And, like, again, that harkens back to, like, old haunted house and gothic horror stuff. Except for Courier. Or good use of maggots too when they stab Freudstein and like instead of blood coming out like maggots and like mud and whatnot like come out. Yeah, that that is something. So here's something that I found interesting: the the murderer of the realtor in this movie. I don't know why the realtor already sold the house or whatever. Goes back and takes a look, gets her foot. Unfortunately, um, I think that's Dagmar Lassner's character. Gets her foot caught in like that tombstone and. You know, instead of getting like a twisted ankle, gets like a, a you know sliced and cut up angle. Freudstein comes up, gets a fire poker, and starts poking her. And when you see the aftermath, you see her eye was damaged. Turns out, but when you see the actual scene play out, there's no eye violence. Turns out they did shoot an eye effect, and Fulci was unhappy with it. It's like, nope, doesn't meet my standard of eye violence. He really so he cut it. Happy. Not up to his usual eye poking standards. <laughs> oh, he, he's like, nope, doesn't work for me. So he cut that out. But like, when you see the aftermath, it's clearly she had her eye like poked with that fire poker. Um, then there's the babysitter death, who I guess was working with Freudstein or helping cleaning up his messes. It's not really clear what. Again, we've already talked about it. But then he kills her, and then, like he stabs her in the neck so many times that her head falls off. It like. The blood gushing is like ridiculous in it. She was, was she also in Inferno? Is that the same actress? Yeah, yeah. Actually, you're right, and I forgot about that. She's um. I think she's supposed to be like. She's the she's one of the three mother mothers yeah. in Inferno, and then she's also the um. She's also the woman that gets killed early on in Tenebrae. Oh right, right, yeah. She's the one who steals the book. Yeah. And for whatever reason. I never realized that until this very moment that you brought it up. Yeah, well, she's got those, like, eyes. She's got really striking eyes, so that's what I remember about her. Well, I, you know, I recognize her. It's like, I know her for something else, but, like, she's definitely, I think because she has, like, bigger hair and, like, Inferno and, like, 
Tenebrae, and she's kind of a little more glamorous. And this one, she's played down. Like, I never made the connection. <laughs> but that, I mean, that also probably is Fulci, like, all right, you don't know how to use this actor, Argento. Let me show you. I'll kill her. <laughs> I'll show you how to kill her in a movie. Um, we already talked about the axe going near Bob's face. And then there's the final Freudstein showdown in the basement where, like, the parents are trying to fight him. And it's just like, nope. Freudstein <laughs> fucks their day up. Yeah, another exercise in futility from uh, Fulci protagonists. <laughs> Now, we talked about the main four of his zombie movies, but we're going to talk about a fifth or four and a half or half, whatever you want to call it, which is Zombie 3. You had never seen it before we were talking about doing this podcast, right, Matthew? Uh, no, yeah, I watched it last week for the first time because I wasn't sure if we were going to go over it or not. <laughs> so I figured I should finally... Uh give it a shot i was surprised to see online people there, there's it's got a little bit of a cult following i was surprised to see I, I thought it was pretty uh universally despised but i guess not there are people who swear by zombie three it, it's utterly ridiculous and you know at a certain point so from what i read Fulci, Fulci's cut of the movie was 70 minutes long before he left. They had to finish the movie, so they recruited the assistant director, who is Bruno Mattei, who's best known for doing Hell, Living Dead, Rats, lots of just batshit insane movies. And Mattei's protege, Claudio Fragasso, who went on direct Zombie 4, Troll 2, lots of other insane fucking batshit movies. So they, they took Fulci's footage, they cut 30 minutes out of it, I think they shot 40 or 50 minutes of their own footage, and they mixed it together, and just basically turned Zombie 3 into this epic, like, ridiculous trash fest. <laughs> they, they shot in the Philippines, it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like these, the four we've been talking about at all, it just feels like a ridiculous zombie movie. It's a lot of fun, I wouldn't say it's great, but like, I also wouldn't really call it a Fulci movie. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I kind of assumed there's, there's, there were some scenes that had a lot of fog or smoke in them, and I was like, those are probably the Fulci scenes. <laughs> there, there's a couple shots where you can see the, the guy that's putting the smoke on screen, you can see him run up, puff smoke, like, in frame, and oh, then okay. disappear. Like, I'm not saying you have to go and rewatch Zombie 3 again if you're not really in the mood, but, like, if you do, be on the lookout, because you can see that dude, like, pumping smoke in the frame a couple times does have like some of the least effective zombies in any movie like they always just end up like wrestling on the ground with everybody for like three or four minutes <laughs> i mean the the thing i like about it there's that there's the dj becomes a zombie dj yeah, at the end dj is... blue heart if i ever dj again i'm gonna i'm gonna use that if no one else has <laughs> <laughs> there's that and then i i look something up and apparently there's one moment in this movie that folgie's really proud of he obviously does not like this movie, and knowing Fulci has talked a lot of shit about it. But he said, like, there's a scene where, like, a like a skull comes flying out of the fridge right. or whatever. He said, like, that wasn't the original script. I just came up with it. It's one of my favorite gags. I love it. It's my favorite thing in this piece of shit kind of thing. And it seemed like it might have influenced, uh, I think, a far better scene from, uh, how do you say it? Michele Suave? Suave? Michele Suave. Michele Suave is uh, Delamore de la Morte, a.k.a. Cemetery Man, that has a similar scene where a head flies out, but is, I think, a much better movie. I mean, there, there's no arguments there. <laughs> so we're going to take a, another quick commercial break, but when we return, it's going to be read, watch, and listen on the Cinematic Void podcast. Stephen, where are you? Please answer me. Steve! In this house, what you don't know will hurt you. <laughs> it was to be a getaway dream. It's becoming a runaway nightmare. Do you see anything? Some old steps going down. He has been awaiting the arrival of his new guests. One by one, they are disappearing. 
one by bloody one. When you move to this house, before you get locked in, read the fine print. Mommy, hurry! You may have just mortgaged your life. Due to the graphic nature of this film, no one under 18 will be admitted. House! By the cemetery. Welcome back. It's now time for <laughs> on the Cinematic Void podcast. Matthew, since you're the guest, why don't you tell us what you've been reading, watching, and listening to? Oh, geez. Well, you know, I did just read that uh, Argento biography, Fear, which uh, you don't really get a lot of like psychological insight into the man, maybe, but it's 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 still you know it's interesting for the historical times you know and what went into making the movies so if you're an argento fan uh, i recommend that uh watching what have i what have been watching lately now i've been watching a lot of tv I, I will say that i think the best tv show of the year during a pandemic was probably what we do in the shadows if you're into like horror and vampires, I think season two is even better than season one. It's oh, I agree. I, I, I really, love that show. I, I think really, it's better than the movie, hands down. And like, yeah, I, I can't wait for season three. Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll recommend that. And uh, as far as like listening to stuff, I've been listening to a lot of like modern post punk and kind of synth wavy stuff. Like, most famous probably being the uh, Belarus band Molchat Doma, who have somehow gotten really popular on the internet, which is kind of surprising for a lo-fi post-punk kind of like, you know, band. But, you know, things things in that vein have been, uh, I've been listening to a lot of that stuff with the, I think the kids called Doomer music. <laughs> it's been kind of listening to, it's all very similar to, you know, all the 80s kind of minimal sense stuff, but you know it's new (laughs) so yeah it's kind of some stuff i've been into how about you nick um i'm still reading that high life matthew stoko book um i i do love this guy's writing but some of this some of like the violence towards women and stuff like that is like it takes it way like it it just takes it way too far these books are disgusting (laughs) <laughs> um but uh so i've actually had to put it down for a couple of days i don't know but uh anyway um graph oracle three is a uh, new like a semi-new full length i've been listening to a bunch uh, it's got conway on it it's got benny the butcher on it it's got roy spot nine on it um super sick jim check that out i think you'll right. it, if you haven't already heard that um and then uh that big ghost uh ltd limited uh widowmaker split with all the like the horror movie stuff on it is awesome. Uh, and then I've been listening to a bunch of Fabio Frizzi just to prepare for today. Um, and then oh, there's this new uh, this new rapper from Baltimore. No, I guess not that new, but DDM uh, Ballad of Omar record came out this year. Super sick. Um, I and oh, and I uh, as far as watching, um, Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson who did. Uh, Resolution and did Spring and The Endless. Um, they did an episode on the new season of Twilight Zone. It's super sick. It has uh, Tim from Rancid in it. Uh, <laughs> and then also once really weird. <laughs> at a, I worked at a Barnes and Noble in Berkeley, and like I guess I looked the part because they were like, "Do you like the band Rancid?" And they I was like, uh, "They're all right." And they're like, "That's our son." They were so like proud. They were just telling. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> my rancid story anyway right then, uh, i finally saw the post the spielberg movie um which i guess you could say is kind of a, a spiritual prequel to like uh, all the president's men which we've talked about in the past um yeah that's it that's what i've been up to and then just tons of i've, I've and then tons of seeing all these uh Fulci movies for the first time since the 90s, honestly, has like oh. been awesome for the past week, you know? Um, and yeah, they're, they're still great. I guess reading, I've been reading the novelization to the movie Roller Coaster. 
which is <laughs> it's quite interesting because the writer is taken. I mean, it follows the movie, but then he takes a lot of liberties and like <laughs> kind of like puts like a misogynist spin on stuff. Like he when he describes any female characters, like it's like really really sexist and grimy. Oh. And like if you, if you've seen Roller Coaster, like the I, movie's I, not anything like that. But it's just like it's like this sleazy pulp not is it just feels like a sleazy pulp writer is just like taking the roller coaster script and like just adding just like sleaze to a movie that didn't really have it in it. And for those of you asking, I haven't got to the bar part where Sparks appears in the movie, so I don't know if they're in the book yet. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> Watching um yeah, it's been nothing but Fulci movies. Uh, like I said, I spent the last week watching basically Zombie, Gates of Hell, The Beyond, and House by the Cemetery all in a row. And it's been it's been nice to kind of revisit them. I mean, I've watched them throughout the years. I've screened three of the four of them. But I've never really sat down and watched them all that continuously. So that's been, it's really been fun. And, you know... I got a few more Fulci stuff to watch since we got a couple more episodes of this Fulci podcast to work on with so some other guests. Coming people's ways. Yeah. Lots of Fulci coming. Coming right for your eye. The main thing I've been listening to is op An Open Tomb and Empty Casket, which is a split between Big Ghost Limited and Widowmaker, which uses a lot of horror movie samples. And I've been really enjoying that. Um, I've thrown on a couple of Umberto records. Because, like, listening to this stuff kind of put me in the mood. Listen to a little bit of Goblin. Also listen to a little bit of Fabio Frizzi. And, yeah, that's about it. All right, so this concludes this episode of the Cinematic Void Podcast. We'll be talking more Fulci over the next few episodes, so stick around for that. Until then, see you in the void.